Welcome back for the, the second day of our colloquium. Um, and without further ado, I will pass the floor to the chair of this session. Christian, it's your, your turn now. Thank you very much and also a warm welcome from my side. We will now start with session five. Yesterday we have discussed a lot about the global, the transnational and the national level, also about imperial connections and even uh, secessionist states. Now we will move on to a different perspective and look at the regional level. Um, we will have uh, four speakers. Three of them are already present here, and Mr. Hadri will join us uh, online. Um, I'm very happy to introduce now the first speaker, Gabriel Godefroy. He is a PhD candidate both in um, France and Germany, working on a thesis on the idea of Central Europe in the life and work of a Hungarian economist. And he will now introduce us to the work and history of the Central European Postal Union. As all speakers, you have 15 minutes, and I will watch over the time. <laughs> Monsieur le Directeur Général Adjoint, Mesdames et Messieurs. Deputy Director General, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and participants, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for having invited me to this Historian's Colloquium of the Universal Postal Union. I am very honored to be here with you to share my presentation on Central European Postal Union, which is part of my research work on uh, Central Europe in the 1920s and 30s, looking at the economic uh, unification of the area after the collapse of Austria-Hungary. I'm delighted to be here in part because my father has uh, been a long-time philatelist and my Christian name Gabriel in the Christian culture refers to Archangel Gabriel, who is considered the patron saint of uh, postal workers and philatelists, and I imagine the Universal Postal Union. So to go to the main core of the subject, following the collapse of the austro Hungarian Empire, the economic policies which were protectionist and national nationalist for the successors. We can see uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany, then we saw a process of uh, postal separation, which we'll look at later. So the protectionist and nationalist uh, policies of the successors, including uh, customs, barriers, created problems for exchanges in uh, Central Europe. So in order to have free exchange, uh, politicians, economists uh, decided to meet in Vienna in September 1925 at the Central European Economic Congress. It was the first where they discussed uh, the modalities for bringing together the Central European economies. So they committed to work on creating a large economic space in Central Europe. So following the first Congress, they decided to meet once more in 1926 in order to discuss issues of transport and communications, because the organizers felt and considered that it was easier to work closely together in those areas than in other economic aspects, partly because of technical reasons, but because there are already institutions in existence which uh, cover economic uh, cooperation before the First World War. So for postal issues, the Postal Administration of Austria, so you can see the General Director Konrad Holheisen, who brings his expertise to the preparatory committee for the Congress. 
and his director general and team support and assist the Congress for Central European economy. The other national administrations don't participate in the event. The consultative and technical committee for communication and transit of the League of Nations sends a delegate, but the Universal Postal Union is not represented at that Congress. During the Congress, the former Minister Georg Gotthein opposes uh, the European having a setting up a European Postal Union in the resolution set up by Elmer Hantos, the uh, economist on, who is the center of my thesis. They speak in favor of the creation of a central European postal union within the U Universal Postal Union. So the first question is why? First of all, we have Georg Gottheim, who wants to restore the pre-war postal relations. Uh, before the First World War, the German and Austro-Hungarian agreement, uh, which uh, follows on from the Austro-German agreement, has a unified uh, postal space in Central Europe. So I can show you here on the map what that represents. So before the First World War, there was a unified postal space between the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So with the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire after the First World War and also because of the process of postal separation, there were new postal administrations in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and also the rebuilding of the Austrian and Hungarian postal managements. So that uh, led to a serious deterioration of postal services in the region. So in 1921, the successors signed an agreement and then there was a com postal convention between Germany and Austria, which will facilitate and improve a little the situation. But it is nevertheless uh, not a very satisfactory situation in comparison to the pre-war status. So for Georg Gottheim, it's not just about acting in the looking at the past and rebuilding what existed, but to think of the future. So he thinks it's necessary to improve postal relations throughout Europe in order to be able to compete with the major economic spaces such as the United States of America and the British Empire. So whilst the postal relations deteriorated in Europe, there were new regulations, different tariffs, and a significant increase in tariffs. So the United States and the British Empire set up a single tariff for the whole uh, economic territories. I need to have some help here with moving the slides. Let's see, could we move for, further forward? One more, please. So, as I was saying, whilst uh, relation, postal relations had deteriorated in Central Europe, in uh, the USA and the British Empire, they had set up single tariffs in their territories and they'd set up an agreement to improve their postal relations and to set up a sort of Anglo-Saxon postal union. And the USA also participated in the Pan-American Postal Union, which is a restricted union within the UPU, with most uh, Central South American states and Spain. So looking at the good relationships that exist within these two economic spaces. So Georg Gottheim thinks that uh, they must and invites the European states to set up their own postal relations to compete. He also regrets that the Universal Postal Union was not able to impose a, a universal stamp or tariff 
So the Central European and the European Postal Service was an area which could be used for internationalizing it, but through regional movements. So how was this done? In order to set up the Central European Postal Union, they needed to set up a single postal territory through two measures, the implementation of common regulations and the removal of transit costs. And they also needed to introduce a Central European postage stamp. So there are two concepts. So one is to have a single color-coded uh, tariff and all participating states could put their own national emblem on the uniform stamp and issue them in their own national currency. But for Georg Gottheim, he felt that it was not necessary to introduce a single tariff for Central Europe. He felt that because of the major tariff differences, the costs are very high in Germany, and also because of currency fluctuations, that would make a single tariff uh, very complex. So he felt it would be simple to reinstall the pre-war system, so the internal tariff would be used for external relations, so for foreign uh, posting, as it happened before. And so, at the 6th uh, Central European Economic Congress uh, in February to March 1930, the German Minister for Post, uh, Georg Schetzel, proposes this measure to his uh, counterparts from the European, uh, the Central European states, and he suggests that they use uh, this to set up relations with the German postal services and that they also apply their internal domestic rates to post going to Germany. He's not concerned about the potential loss of earnings because he can see an increase of postal exchange with Germany, so that will make up for any losses. But the German minister for post doesn't manage immediately to convince the other national Central European administrations to participate in his project or the European Postal Union projects which were set out under the Briand Plan in uh, France. Uh, I suggest you could read Leonard Labori's work on this history, and I'm very pleased to be able to hear the two other contributions on our subject. Thank you very much for having listened. Yeah, thank you so much, Gabriel, also for time discipline. <laughs> so um, I'm happy now to introduce you to the second speaker in this session, Sabrina Broschmann. Um, she has um, done her PhD on the European Postal and Telecommunications Union and also already published her book, Creating the New Europe Through Postal Services, Setting Standards During World War II, for those who are interested, it has come out with a German publisher, Nomos, and is also available open access. So uh, welcome, Sabrina, uh, and we are looking forward to your talk on the European Postal and Telecommunications Union. Thank you very much for the introduction um, and the invitation and the organization. It's been um, a nice day yesterday, and I hope we can continue to do um, the same. Granted, the title of my presentation is kind of pointed, um, but there is a story behind it. When I went to the archives of the Swiss PTT, I was asked exactly that question. And so I thought, upon my return to Bern, I will try to finally answer it. My hypothesis today is that the EPTU was not there to replace the UPU. Uh, by the way, EPTU is what I will in, in the following use as the uh, abbreviation of European Postal and Telecommunications Union because it's quite a long name. But the EPTU was a restricted uh, union within the UPU that Nazi Germany would have surely used to try and obtain influence and power 
surely also with revisionist aims towards France. The EPTU was entire in essence, an imperial project exporting German standards to a European area, thereby laying the groundworks for the never defined but often mentioned new order of Europe that fascism was supposed to install after the war. In order to approach the question, I will first give you a short overview of what the EPTU was before turning to the UPU and EPTU relations. In 1940, there were two different initiatives uh, that attempted to create institutions that would help compensate for the problems in international communications caused by the Second World War. There was the initiative by German and Italian engineers to create a working group for telecommunications. And within the Reichspostministerium, there was a department created to establish a European postal union. In the end, telecommunications were integrated into the EPTU in the form of two specialized committees. I have divided the existence of the EPTU into three phases, which I will now use to very quickly summarize the EPTU's history. Within the initiation phase, the EPTU was prepared by bilateral agreements with the majority of later member administrations. This is not a new strategy for regionalization. We've seen it with the German-Austrian Postal Union and so on. These bilateral agreements are of high importance because the same standards that were within these agreements were later discussed upon the European Postal Congress. The first bilateral agreement was signed with Italy in October 1941. This was important because the EPTU was later presented as an access project, even though one can discuss the balance between the German and Italian powers, but this is not the question today. The decision phase begins with the European Postal Congress held in Vienna in October 1942. During it, the administration agreed upon the founding of the first European Postal Union, as well as on standardizing the tariffs between countries on the inner German system for civilian letters and postcards. This is a, a system that Gabriel has mentioned uh, before, just to point out the continuities. The second main result of the Congress was the abolition of the transit charge between the countries, which I don't have to explain here is a long discussed issue. It was part of the memorandum by von Stefan and was thus a major goal of the Reichspost and was also presented as a major success of the Reichspost. The working phase starts with the entry into force of the agreements from the Congress in Vienna in April 1943. But essentially after that, as you can imagine, um, this phase was quite unsuccessful. In June 1943, there was a committee session for postal service. It had few results and they weren't enacted because you needed a Congress to enact the results of committees. But the two planned Congresses in 1943 and 1944 had to be cancelled due to the war developments. With the defeat of Germany, it was out of the question that the Union would be continued and the standards were abolished at different times by different administrations. In the following, the last administration to do so was probably the Hungarian one in March 1946. In the graphic, and I apologize, this is not entirely correct, but this was the closest to the actual situation I could find. Um, you will find the member administrations in a darker green color. In a lighter green, these are the administrations from countries that were invited to the Congress, but then disinvited shortly before the Congress. And in a darker blue, where the observer countries, um, these are Spain, Turkey, and Switzerland. So these countries came to the European Postal Congress in October 1942, but didn't actually become members of the Union. And in a lighter blue, you will find Sweden and Portugal. The administrations of those countries were invited, but did not participate in the end. While the EPTU was founded during the war, it was certainly not meant to be a war organization. But it was uh, the idea was that it would work to its full capacity after the war, um, and this intention is clearly um, clearly yeah, receivable in the sources. Um, there were so many more plans for more standards within the Reichspostministerium that would only be able to actually be implemented after war. But since fortunately the war didn't end with a German victory, uh, they were never enacted. For postal services, it has to be said that the Reichspost was the, clearly the, the leading actor within the EPTU. 
also with the regards to the access partner Italy, different administrations had different leeway in in their actions. Most prom pro prominently is probably the refusal of Belgium to join the union. Last but not least, the EPTU shows that the wartime was not necessarily a cesura in European postal cooperation, but rather it represents a connection between the interwar and the afterwar time. It strongly built upon the previous ideas and experience and structures, though of course it has to be mentioned under very different circumstances and different political aims. And allow me one sentence to the discussion we had yesterday upon unpolitical standards and technicalities. This is one time when not only the framework is very political, but also the standards that are set are quite political. And in part, these are the same experts in the interwar war and afterwar time. In the following, I will touch upon different aspects of EPTU and UPU relations, starting with some contextualizations. It starts with the 1939 Congress in Buenos Aires, where Überschau points out in his history of the German Reichspost from 1939 to 1945 that politics played a strong part in it because in the final document Czechoslovakia was still mentioned, which was unacceptable for the German side. So Hitler in the end decided not to sign. Um, the final document, yet the Reichspost found a way to surround it by applying uh, the convention only to non-hostile countries because it wasn't quite happy with the decision um, by Hitler. Secondly, international organizations, though maybe counterintuitive from the fascist propaganda on nationalism and the League of Nations and so on, were an important part of the international strategies of these um, of these countries. They used and created international organizations as platforms, instruments of power and the diffusion of their own programs. As Madeleine Heron has um, so rightly formulated it, there were different strategies, close, undercut, transform and create. And this is why I think that the EPTU was meant to be an instrument to obtain power within the UPU and then maybe influence um, the decisions towards uh, German thinking. And thirdly, I know we have talked a lot about Heinrich von Stefan, but I cannot not mention him today because for the Reichspost, this was uh, the one idol. He was omnipresent in their thinking and writing. Every Almost every member of the leading staff within the European Postal Union that came from Germany had either written a book or an article about him. Um, and it comes through through the sources that in a way they saw themselves as continuing this legacy of Heinrich von Stefan with the European Postal Union. So sort of uh, making the Reichspostminister Wilhelm, Wilhelm Ohnesorge the von Stefan of his time in a sense. And this is actually also one of the arguments why I don't think the EPTU was supposed to replace the Universal Postal Union because of this really omnipresence and admiration of Heinrich von Stefan. Within the expert community, the EPTU was only ever presented as a restricted union, which it institutionally also was. Article 5, now Article 9 of the Universal Postal Convention allows for these unions, and they are also certainly not the first one. Uh, so there's the Nordic Postal Union, there's the South American Postal Union, and with its enlargements and so on. And as Gabriel has pointed out, and I would point out to the works of Leonard Labouré as well, um, they, they, the Nazis also weren't the first to think about a European postal union, and they weren't the last either, as Valentina <laughs> should surely present us. Within the Reichspost, the need for the union was explained with the contemporary non-functioning of the UPU due to the war and the fact that a general union such as the UPU could not properly respond to European specificities. To Hitler, by the way, on a side note, the Union was explained as an instrument to exploit occupied countries, though it was not specified how exactly that was going to happen. Um, in German articles, it was explained um, sort of with the same reasoning as within the Reichspost. There's a strong focus on the UPU currently not working and the necessity for a European Postal Union. I've brought your citation of uh, the Reichspostminister and the Völkischer Beobachter, um, which reads in English, now that the string between the old and the new world is torn, this is proper Nazi rhetoric is, um, with uh, respect to the interwar time, 
And the Universal Postal Convention, note convention, not union, is only a fragment when we underline the practice, a matter of habit, what has been a necessity for a long time could become reality. The perspective on the question has been up until now very German. I would now like to turn shortly to other countries. Uh, this is where I could actually find a discussion on the future of the EPTU in a post-war Europe. And it's not that my colleague and I haven't tried. We went to 16 archives in 11 countries, but either the discussion around this topic wasn't documented or it simply wasn't discussed. For the Swiss, I think this might be interesting, PTT, there's actually no hints at the question or any fear that this might replace the Universal Postal Union. There's one instance where the Swiss PTT deems a proposal that was made by the German administration as too political. It concerns newspapers. They were actually scared that uh, once enacted, the standard would... Uh, would lead to them being flooded by German newspaper and propaganda. Otherwise, all the proposals were approved by the Swiss administration and the observer to the Congress for Switzerland, Ernest Bonjour, concluded that in the end, Switzerland would not be able to stay out of the EPTU if the union continued to exist due to its benefits for the consumers. This was seen entirely different by the Spanish postal administration. They didn't sign a bilateral agreement because they found it too political and they didn't want to join the EPTU because they thought it would endanger the Universal Postal Union. It is not explained in the sources how it would endanger the Universal Postal Union. And it has to be said that Spain, with its own restricted union, in a sense, and also with the special relationship between the Franco regime and, the Na and Nazi Germany and his focus on the Hispanidad, sorry for the pronunciation, um, might also have a different context for analyzing the EPTU in this way. To conclude, obviously, because the EPTU existed for such a short time, there is no actual real relationship between the EPTU and the UPU. There's an article published in the L'Union Postale um, by one of the leading yeah, leading actors within the German Reichspost to create the Universal Postal Union and, of course, once the agreements were ent entered into force, um, this information about the agreement was spread around um, through the UPU's channels, but otherwise there's no documentation of any kinds of further context. The question around the EPTU's future role within the UPU were not dominant or not documented at the time. So, it doesn't seem like to have been an intensive discussion. And from the German side, it has to be repeatedly said that it was constantly underlined that this was just a regional union. And from the statutes of the EPTU, it also really was, it was open to European and neighboring countries. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have now the third presentation by Valentina Vadabasso. We stay within Europe, but we move on in time. Valentina um, is a researcher and specialist for European political history. Uh, she has dealt also with parliamentary history, but also technological aspects of European integration and teaches contemporary history in Paris and Angers. Um, and we will now hear her uh, presentation on the origins of the European Postal Union. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. So I am going to talk about the um, European Postal Union and its very beginning. So I am going to cover the circumstances in which this project um, came to light. It um, had uh, difficulty evolving from 49 to 55. Uh, there were a series of interruptions. Well, it started with as a diplomatic project and then other protagonists um, unions industrial uh, organizations and 
other participated in it, but it started off as a diplomatic project um, with uh, state actors and non-state actors. So, in my research, I sought to demonstrate that this um, a European Postal Union was born way before the European Coal and Steel community, but when Messine was relaunched, this project became a tool of the ECSC for uh, further integration with the union. So that was um, in Europe. So that's what I um, researched and I found archives in Paris, some in Florence. And then I found information about the uh, evolution of, of the EPTU and the UPU um, through the archives I found here. So. The first part of my research was about the birth of this um, uh, European Union, Postal Union. And then it, in Rome, I carried out research about the history of posts in Europe from the beginnings up until 1956. Now, we've got to the um, literature at the, on the European Postal Union. It's um, There wasn't much data there. It was Mr. Labori mainly that had worked on it, but there wasn't much literature. And so, first concerning the way in which the project um, was started, well, it was separate from the ECSC. There was a postal union between France and Italy after the war, and that convention was open to other countries. However, the project unfortunately um, got bogged down in the failed ne customs negotiations between France and Europe, and then it was born again in the Council of Europe. But from 49 to 1955, there were a series of false starts. So in 1951, the Parliamentary Assembly blocked a project to launch it uh, at the European level because some monarchies, some countries uh, wanted the image of the uh, sovereign, the king or the president of the republic on uh, the European stamps. And then in 1953, it was the Council of Ministers that blocked this um, project of a European Postal Union. And what's uh, striking is that the 18 countries of Europe were against this project, um, including countries of the ECSC, France, Italy, among others, because they considered the project too technical. So what were the difficulties these countries faced according to the archives? Well, the competition from the UPU, most likely. So there was no need to create the union at a regional level. And there was another important issue, which countries should be part of this European uh, Postal Union? The 18 countries of the Council of Europe, or should it be a much more restricted union? And so the third reason, and, uh, and this uh, brings me back to Sabrina's study, um, it was a weight of the past that was still in the minds of decision makers. There was a fear that uh, the uh, past experience would be repeated. For instance, uh, Hitler thought of creating um, a postal union, and so there was fear that one country would dominate others. Um, the war was over, but it was still in people's minds. So from 49 to 55, the project was rejected, but in 1955, the French Minister for Posts um, introduced a memorandum which was rather revolutionary. Why? Well, because he proposed to organize a European conference of postal experts in Europe and the memorandum was very important. Why? Because it proposes the organization of a conference and also voiced the idea of modernizing posts throughout 
uh, Europe with, uh, in the back of his mind, the idea of further integration in Europe. So the modernization were of the post would be twofold, administrative and technical. And the memorandum was first introduced in July 49 to the Council of Europe, which approved it. And a couple of days later, at the 20th of July, it was submitted to the Intergovernmental Committee meeting in Messine. And that was a very important moment because it's as of then that this project of a European postal union um, was linked to the European Coal and Steel Community, the ECSC. So the conference in Messine uh, designated as a subcommittee and that subcommittee started drafting the first organigram of the European Postal Union. And this subcommission, which was a working commission to create this European uh, Postal Unions, was composed of the six ministers for post of the ECSC. And that is why I believe that this project of a European Postal Union is very closely intertwined with the European Coal and Steel Community. And in January 1956, a meeting took place in Paris, a very important meeting, and the six ministers for post and telecommunications um, of uh, the ECSC on that occasion linked uh, this uh, um, EPTU project to the ECSC. And then in March 1956, there was a, a conference in Paris. Nothing was decided on that occasion. All the decisions were postponed and um, in, to the conference in Rome or in October, November 1956. I believe that the Rome conference was the founding uh, moment of this um, European Postal Union. Why? Because many decisions that were sent to uh, submitted to Paris in January 56 or in March to the conference in Paris in March were then um, submitted to Rome. So what was decided and why do I think that that conference was really the founding moment? Well, it's then that a single uh, tarification for air mail was adopted and also rates for the member countries of the ECSC and of the Postal Union were to apply the same rates. And it was very difficult to find a solution. The Dutch were the ones that found a solution. What did they propose? Well, some countries um, had many reservations, were against it, because the majority of uh, postal administrations at the time uh, run a deficit. And so they didn't have enough uh, income and were the, uh, the delays were therefore financial but the dutch managed to come to to find a solution how well up until then the rates of the upu had applied but as of then there was a tariff that started to apply among the six members of the ECSC. And that rate, the adoption of that rate was the um, founding moment of this um, uh, European Postal Union. And then standardization required the standardization of the rates, but also of letters on a technical level. So this issue of standardizing letters was a huge diplomatic issue. Why? Because the first that were concerned were the paper industry of the different members. 
in Paris, there were many engineers, very technical um, um, businesses that were closely, or that were very much concerned by this. So, this automation um, of letters and a standardization of the, the um, letters was alarming to some member states. And so, initially, the Italians and the English wanted different parameters to apply, but in Rome, it was decided all letters should have the same format. However, the issue was postponed to different conferences in Brussels in 68. Countries finally agreed on the letters dimensions. The French managed to impose uh, the color red for all mailboxes. And then another issue that is of interest is that it was also important at the time to um, ensure swifter delivery and so to do away with many of the checks um, to accelerate the mail flow. So the technical issues were also of a technical, uh, the technical issues were also political in nature because um, the states wanted to ensure they made this um, European integration more visible. They wanted the ECSC to become more visible. What uh, was lacking was a visibility, and that's why they wanted to create a European stamp. What they had in mind is, was greater visibility. And then uh, there were other political interests as well. The European coal and steel community was based on uh, coal and steel initially, but uh, had remained uh, a rather a distant project in the mind of many uh, citizens and only concerned coal and steel. But um, the idea was to bring European um, citizens closer through uh, common rates and uh, standards. So, this uh, European integration was a cross-border, um, inter-regional project, but it was too early to call it a supranational project. There was a lot of resistance among states. It was quite clear um, within the postal administrations, uh, matters that were still dealt with uh, domestically. Then in 1956, an exhibition was organized by the ESC, ECSC in Rome, um, inaugurated by the president of Rome at the time, and paying tribute to the organizers. So, there had already been Schumann's uh, great speech, but they went beyond the ECSC. So, what, what the exhibition aimed to do was to show the common roots of all European countries. And through technique and progress, uh, they would they aim to demonstrate this. So they aim to show that progress would be possible through uh, sharing knowledge. It was an exhibition on 6,000 square meters on the mechanization of posts in Europe. So uh, it was a huge exhibition close to the um, airfield in Rome. And it was in two parts. Uh, one part of the exhibition was on the present and one part on the past. So they, the Roman systems, 
and uh, the role of um, of all the different protagonists before uh, mailmen and they even went all the way back to the second century before Christ. Uh, they show all the itineraries uh, from Rome to Spain. Unfortunately, there aren't any pictures left of the exhibition. However, there was quite a lot of uh, media coverage uh, and the Italians and English um, both claim to have invented the uh, the stamp, the English in 1840 created a system um, and the Italians, another one dating back to the Savoy times and the discussions on the matter is still ongoing. The English emphasized the role of uh, Queen Victoria, then the Italians are also um, still discussing how they, do, they created the first stamps. The objective was also to reduce uh, waiting times. The English created um, one of the first uh, electronic machines able and another machine was then invented able to sort through uh, 3,000 uh, letters very quickly. So in conclusion there isn't much literature about uh, the creation of this uh, European Postal Union. My objective um, was really just to give you a few ideas uh, of uh, this uh, European Postal Union, which was a tool of the ECSC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are now moving on to the last presentation. We will leave Europe and um, we are very happy that Mouyedien Hadri will introduce us to the work of the Arab Postal Union. Mr. Hadri um, is currently a professor of international relations at Tunis University and a member of the International Scientific Committee at UNESCO in Paris. And he has also a long trajectory of practical work with international organizations. So I hope you can hear us. I hope technology is working fine and we look forward to the online presentation. Professor Hadri, please unmute yourself. Mute, please. Okay. Professor Hadri, can you please unmute yourself? We don't hear you. Oh, yeah. Mr. Hadri, um, hello. Hear us. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Hello. Yes. Can you hear hello. me? See you. I don't know. The video. Elle est là. So normally the video should be working. I'm just looking into it. Can you see me now? Uh, 
We we can't see you, but we do hear you. Oh, well, I'm not too sure why you can't see me. And then you can start with your presentation. Okay. Yeah, the presentation is visible now. So we are looking forward to. Voilà, merci beaucoup de vous donner la parole. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm delighted to join this uh, high level event. And I will be talking about a regional organization, an Arab regional or organization uh, entitled the Arab Postal Union. I will attempt to give you an overview, um, some information about its the when it was founded and um, its uh, economic role. So this Arab Postal Union was modeled on all other specialized uh, organizations, uh, including in Europe. Yesterday, we had a pr presentation of different postal organizations in Europe, um, Latin America and elsewhere. And I listened with much interest this morning um, the presentations on the European Postal Unions uh, and organizations. So first, I will try to give you a brief oversight of the Arab Postal Union, its statutes, its objectives as a specialized Arab organization. And then I will attempt to, to um, give you an overview of the close relations between the um, Arab Postal Union and the UPU, and uh, will cover the main projects of uh, digitization that are currently on the agenda. And then I will give you a case study based on uh, the Tunisian experience of uh, postal matters. Uh, but Tunisia is a country with um, a huge amount of experience and great um, levels of performance in a postal matter. So the um, first a couple of inf some information about this Arab Postal Union, which was founded in Syria in Damas in 52 on the basis of a recommendation and a constitutive resolution. Um, and I wanted to recall in passing that the uh, Arab League was uh, founded in 45, a couple of months after the UN was created. The objective was uh, to create a pan-Arab organization with a view to uh, ensuring uh, relations, international relations between the Arab countries of the um, time. It then became um, the Postal Commission um, and moved to Cairo. So, this statute provides that the objectives are to organize uh, postal services within the Arab world, to improve the postal services throughout that region. So at the time, they those countries were dominated by some Western countries such as France, Italy, uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, so there wasn't a, such an organization at the Arab level uh, for communications to um, make a telephone call, you had to go through London, Paris, uh, Rome. So the objective was to uh, um, organize the services and um, the provision of services in the Arab countries. And so they were um, modeled on the various postal organizations throughout the world. So here you see um, the map of the countries covered, 22 member countries um, from the Western coast, Mauritania to um, the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia and others that were part and members of the Arab League. So among the events that have a symbolic meaning is that um, a decision was made to commemorate every year the 
um, the day of the Arab um, posts, or the Arab Post Day on the 3rd of August each year, uh, and a commemorative stamp is issued this uh, on that occasion each year. So here you see uh, the image of the stamp that was issued um, by the United Arab Emirates. And so each country has its own uh, symbols on the stamp. And I just wanted to point out to one of the great developments in the postal and telecommunications um, area, it's the creation of a um, Arab SAT, a regional telecommunication, telecommunication system. Um, that uh, was created in 76 by 22 uh, countries to ensure better uh, satellite uh, telecommunications uh, and telecommunications between the Arab states. So here you see the on the map the countries covered by Arab Sat. So it um, covers an area from the north of Africa to part of the Middle East. And this was a great step forward uh, in enabling Arab states to communicate um, and uh, uh, for telecommunications and uh, through telecommunications and post. And so this was a main step forward um, in transforming the postal uh, space in the region. So by way of comparison, on this graph you see um, the number of posts in the world by region in 2020. And you see that the um, greatest, uh, largest in the world is the Asia Pacific region. Um, with uh, close to 300,000 um, post offices, uh, then secondly, Europe and the IS, and then uh, the Middle East. In 2020, in the Arab world, there were 118,000 employees and 20,500 some post offices. And then in third position, you see Africa which is slightly um, um, below uh, the, that level in terms of postal services, uh, so just over 7,900 postal centers. They had the fewest post office, uh, so it's quite far behind other um, industrialized countries. So, globally, the historic uh, relations between the UPU and the UPA, they really date back a long way. At least two countries, Egypt and Tunisia, joined the UPU in 1874, immediately after the founding of the Universal Postal Union in Bern. And in 1934, Egypt uh, hosted the uh, Universal Postal Union's Congress for the first time on the African continent. And in 1957, the Arab Postal Union participated in the UPU Congress in Ottawa in 1957. So we have the statutes of the Arab Postal Union, which uh, foresees the application or, and cooperation with the UPU in Bern. And it's ensuring that there are communications between the peoples of uh, the Arab world. So some cooperation uh, projects and some assistance projects that have been covered by the UPU for a number of countries in the Arab region. So on the 1st of August 2008, there was an agreement between the Arab countries 
for the uh, money transfers, electronic money transfers, with the assistance uh, on the technical side from the UPU. And that covered uh, five countries, Egypt, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Morocco, Qatar, Syria, Tunisia, and Yemen. And so that was uh, agreed and signed at the 24th uh, Congress of the UPU in Geneva. Another very successful and efficient project was that of the launching of the UPU training center in uh, Tunis in 2016 and the UPU financed the creation of the UPU training center for the Arab region in Tunis and in particular it provided a, a large number of technicians and engineers to work with the union for training and that uh, assisted 22 postal administrations in our region. Now, here's some information on the history and the cooperation process between the UPU and the Arab Postal Union. And I think it would be useful to talk about uh, an experience uh, that the Tunisian Post, which is considered the number one. So they carried out a case study. First of all, some information on the history of the Tunisian Post. It's the oldest and has the most experience uh, within the Arab world. In 1847 is when they set up the first uh, components of a postal and telegraphic service with the opening of a first post office in Tunis. So that's quite um, early in the history of postal services and so it's considered a pioneer. In 1861, on the 19th of April, Tunisia adhered to the telegraphic convention which was concluded in Brussels and Bern in 1858. And uh, it also, uh, Tunisia joined the UPU at the same time as France in 1878. And uh, then we had the opening from of postal services in cooperation with France. And then they joined the French mainland services. But generally, Tunisia continued the process and in 1918, in May 1918, there was an opening of uh, postal account services. And then we had the rapid uh, e EMS post uh, set up in 82, 1982 in Tunisia. They, they were one of the first to do so in our region. Here you can see a letter from Tunis sent to Marseille on the 6th of July, 1867. So you can see that the second half of the 19th century was one where Tunisia had uh, postal relations, not only with France, but uh, other European countries, Italy, Spain, Austria, and so forth. And so we can consider that it was certainly very uh, novel for the region. Now to come back, we can really talk about the performance of the Tunisian Post, which is uh, classified as the best African and Arab postal service. It's the Universal Postal Union, which uh, in April 2018 gave Tunisia, awarded Tunisia the first place in Africa and the uh, Arab world. And that's the third consecutive uh, year that they won the award. And the Tunisian post is uh, listed uh, in 44th place or out of 168 uh, postal establishments throughout the world. And that is based on the Postal Development Integrated index, so the 2IPD. So that means that Tunisia is, uh, has built information uh, experience throughout the region. And then 
In second place, we have countries such as the United Arab Emirates and Morocco, who also have, have good performance in the Arab region. And the 5th and 6th of October 200, 2016, Tunisia was elected a member of the Administra Administration Council of the UPU for 2017 to 2020 at the 26th uh, Universal Postal Congress in Istanbul. And I can also add that uh, Tunisia is considered by African countries as a model country in the area of postal services and in 2010 the Tunisian Post exported its know-how to 20 African countries who signed uh, bilateral partnership agreements uh, for technical support. Many people from all over Africa come to uh, be trained in Tunis and uh, benefit from the experience of Tunisia that uh, we have a partnership agreement signed with some 20 countries uh, such as Cote d'Ivoire, Congo, uh, Mauritius, uh, Uganda, Liberia, and we have another 14 African countries, particular from Western Africa, who have previously signed uh, agreements. We also have a great deal of experience in Tunisia in uh, e-commerce, and we are considered, uh, Tunisian Post is considered a leader. And so in January 2017, the Tunisian Post uh, joined the UPU major project and set the first stones of e-commerce in Africa, e-com Africa. And so this will help African countries to coordinate their work and their relations in the area of e-commerce and in particular of the rapid post services. So we can say confidently that this major project will make Tunisia the door to Africa for e-commerce and it will be a sort of electronic exchange point for goods and for telephone and telecommunications transmission. So that is some information on both the history of the Arab Postal Union and its cooperation with the UPU. And I think if the aim of this colloquium is to create a single postal territory, we should consider this as one of the factors in progress that we're seeing that comes from the Tunisian Post and they've also worked on the development of uh, economic relations throughout the world and we should recall that at the 27th UPU Congress uh, in August 2021 in Côte d'Ivoire, the African continent The African continent committed to ensure coordination between countries in Africa. And I would like to say the next Congress will, of the UPU will be taking place in the United Arab Emirates. The 28th Congress will be taking place in 2025. And I think the Emirates have uh, undertaken to organize a major Congress, which will be another step forward in the area of the relations between the Arab Postal Union and the UPU. So that is a conclusion. I think I've uh, finished uh, in good time. Thank you for listening. And I remain available if you have any questions. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Professor Radri. We have Thank now very much. 15 minutes for questions <coughs> and contributions from your side. So please. Morning. 
J'ai une question pour M. Gabriel. I have a question for Mr. Gabriel Godefroy. Could you please tell us a little more about the Potro's agreements that you mentioned in your presentation? And that was the first uh, conference between the successor countries of the and uh, they set up the postal tariff tariffs that were reduced uh, within the economic space mainly for economic reasons between Italy and the various successor states which uh, was in force until the eve of the Second World War. Thank you. No further questions for the moment. Can you hear me? Yes. You sort of answered the question already. I don't know all the details of the Portero's agreement of 20, 1921. But it's the first conference after the war that looked at the settling of all economic uh, issues, uh, many economic issues of the successor states. Uh, and uh, they had serious um, political problems. And until that agreement, there weren't many agreements for any type of uh, postal exchange, uh, no tariffs, no contracts that regulated that. So we got to a point where the tariffs were lowered and there was an increase in postal exchanges. We had a period where there was difficulty, there were still thoughts that there might be a restoration of the Habsburg monarchy and countries such as Czechoslovakia and Poland. So it was Italy that took on the lead which considered itself also a successor state of the Austro-Hungarian Empire because they recovered some territory from the former empire. And so uh, Italy played a significant role. And uh, this brought Poland and Italy into this postal say, space that was brought about by this convention. It goes beyond the borders of the Austro-Hungarian empire but it doesn't bring in germany germany continued with the traditional sort of uh, german austro-hungarian postal agreement so we have lots of minor agreements but the main agreement is the potter rose agreement which is going to remain in vigor in 20 the 1920s and 30s yes I have a question for Sabrina Proschman. I'd like to know how her work clarifies the political role of an expert within the framework of the UPU and maybe beyond that. Thank you for this question. I'm going to answer in English. <laughs> it's easier. Yes. Um, well, um, I think because the the union was created at such a very different political time than usually a regional union were um, approached, um, the experts have a have a different role. For instance, you can see that very clearly in the documents of the uh, Danish postal administration, where the the entire attitude towards the European Postal and Telecommunications Union is derived from the um, political um, idea of appeasement policy of Denmark towards towards Germany. So the um, postal delegates had sort of the job to, um, yeah, to translate this policy of appeasement into how they were acting within the European, European Postal and Telecommunications Union. And you can see that by the fact that actually the Danish uh, the Danish delegates proposed to go even further with the transit charge abolition, looking at sea post, which is of course during the war completely impossible, and but also the fact that the Danish postal administration hosts the only postal committee session within uh, during the time of of this union. So I think the fact, and from from that 
a special example uh, going further on, I think the fact that you are within a union where the standards of one country are supposed to be just expanded towards all the other countries and the experts having to deal with that sort of standardization um, shows that they're not just simply in a, in a technical spectrum where they have to navigate um, what is best for their countries, but they have to, in many cases, think about the fact that their country is being occupied and brutally occupied um, while they are negotiating with the German uh, Reichspost about these new standards. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments in the room? <laughs> I have a question on how linked to Ms. Vardabasso's uh, presentation. Yes, I very much agree that the exposure to postal mechanization in uh, the 1950s was a turning point and a change of uh, organizations uh, of postal services within Europe because it was an exhibition that was really surprising at that time. So it was just a little comment related to that exhibition. Yes, it, it was important because the issue was uh, giving visibility to this European integration project, uh, uh, going beyond the project that had already been started uh, with the coal steel mission, but it was a double path. The common routes, if we think back to the past and the future, this community the Europeans needed to have the convenience of a European postal community where we look at Belgium, where one operator can deal with 3,000 letters in the United Kingdom, the, the English who had electronic reading. So I think it was an important conference. It uh, gave visibility to the European project. The discussions remain national because uh, the countries were looking at their own country, but a universal stamp for, for 80 countries was approved, but there was still a national aspect to it all. So from that point of view, it's very interesting to read the catalogues of that uh, exhibition. I suggest uh, that it's very important, not only for the photographs, which are really interesting. Now, I haven't found any pictures of the exhibition in the National Archives in Paris. I found photographs of... The photographs are in the catalogue. You should be able to find a catalogue in the libraries. Thank you. Last opportunity for any other questions or comments. Sébastien Richesse, Comité pour l'Histoire de la Poste, une question. Sébastien uh, Richesse, for the Postal History Committee. I have a question uh, for Mr. Adri. I'm very interested to hear about uh, the uh, how old the Tunisian Postal Service is and uh, uh, is there a mu postal museum in Tunisia? Something which would show and uh, make uh, available this very interesting history. And it would also be interesting to think about Nicolas Croix's work, his uh, work on the Algerian Post, uh, which was supported by the Postal History Committee. Professor Hadri? Did you get the question? Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, me côté là. Can you hear me now? Very good. Thank you for that question. Unfortunately, we don't have a museum as such. We have a large 
building the we call it the postal hotel or building where we can find some of the documentation on the history of the Tunisian post but unfortunately there's not yet a museum as such and I think that it's an idea that uh, should uh, come about because I think we can say this with all modesty the experience of the Tunisian post is uh, a pioneer in the area within the area within uh, Africa at least and we have major relationships building with African countries and also with countries in the Arab sphere I, we don't have one yet, but I haven't found any thesis on the uh, Tunisian post because it's a pity. I'm unfortunately not a, a postal historian. I am a historian on international relations and in particular specializing in the Arab world and Tunisia. And I was struck by the fact that there are no organized archives. So I think we have to look here and there all the time for bits and pieces of documentation, but we don't yet have a museum for the Tunisian Post. Maybe that would be an idea to try and launch that one day, but I'll keep your idea. We need to work further on the idea. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, thanks to all of our for speakers for introducing us to the regional dynamics of postal cooperation. We have now a slightly extended coffee break until 10.45. Uh, there are two of us uh, today moderating this session. Myself, my name is Christian Sund. I'm a, a professor at the Boskilde University in Denmark. And I have the pleasure of having uh, my colleague and, and good friend, uh, economist at uh, the UPU, Jose Anson. Um, we have split a little bit our uh, role, so I will uh, say welcome to the, the first speaker today, and then Jose will come and introduce uh, the second speaker. This session uh, has the title, The UPU Material World on Stamps, Envelopes, and Electronic Mail. So we are going to have, uh, for the, the pleasure of uh, the young participants from the International uh, French School, uh, of uh, moving all the way from the good old physical stamps and envelopes that you young people maybe are not so familiar with anymore to the electronic communication where you are, of course, much more advanced users than many of the rest of us. We have uh, three speakers lined up today, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Daniel uh, Piazza. And uh, Daniel Piazza is uh, with the uh, Smithsonian Institution, the National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C., and he will be joining us uh, online. So uh, I, I expect everything will be lined up. I had the pleasure myself to visit this museum uh, many years ago in 2008, and it is truly worth uh, visiting this museum if you ever have uh, the possibility of doing so. And uh, Daniel will talk about the unintended role of the UPU in the creation of postal museums around the world. So with uh, no further ado, I would like to pass the word to our first speaker. All right, thank you very much. Let me uh, just share my screen here. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my greetings and very warm thanks to the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to address you today. We're nearing the end of a very successful conference, and so I promise to, to keep it light, and we can also look at some very pretty stamps together, which is always fun. Um, my presentation is titled UPU Specimen Stamps and the World's Postal Museums an accidental history. And this history is accidental in several respects. Uh, first of all, the research project was suggested to me accidentally uh, by my attempts to locate UPU specimen stamps 
in the collection of the National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, where I've been a curator for more than 15 years. And so I, I just sort of stumbled on this as a research project to begin with. But it's also an accidental history in the sense that these stamps were never really intended to be in museum collections at all, uh, as we shall see in a few moments. So this is very much a work in progress, um, and, and I'll flesh out the main themes of my research so far. Um, but I would very much like to hear from you and have input in the Q&A session, and also to take correction from you on such points as, as may be necessary. And I'll also share my contact information with you at the uh, on the last slide at the end of the talk. As I alluded to earlier, today's talk concerns one aspect of the work of the UPU's International Bureau, uh, which from the beginning has been an information sharing body connecting member nations. As it was founded in 1874, its purpose was to collect and share official statistics and regulatory documents received from member nations, and also to assist host countries that were chosen to organize the periodic UPU Congresses. And then at the 1878 Postal Union Congress in Paris, uh, the International Bureau had added to its responsibilities uh, the job of circulating copies of member countries' postage stamps uh, among member nations. And these exchanges were, and still are, ostensibly meant to ensure that mail bearing legitimate postage stamps would be handled according to UPU regulations, and also to facilitate the identification of forgeries in the global mail stream. To be very honest, I can find little evidence that any postal administration, at least in the period that I've studied, which is down through about the early 1950s, that any postal administration that received these reference collections really used them as they were intended. Um, some British colonies and Latin American countries, I've seen a lot of evidence to suggest that they simply periodically destroyed these collections particularly in other smaller and remote places, stamps from these UPU distributions seem to have leaked out of the official archives and into the collector market. And we can find collectors writing and talking about and examples of these stamps being in private ownership as early as the 1930s. So clearly they were coming, uh, they were, there were some mechanisms for them coming onto the marketplace. Uh, and then uh, the number of these stamps appearing in the in collector hands really began increasing in the 1950s. Um, I suspect, though I have not yet proved, uh, that this is as a result of a number of the post World War II independence movements, uh, movements, a number of countries pass out of existence, and and there's a there's a ready and willing collector market to receive their official archives. Of, uh, of of specimen stamps when they uh, when when these countries go out of existence or are absorbed by newly created countries, and then starting in the late 1970s, uh, many thousands of bureau distributed specimen stamps begin being sold at public auction or by private treaty, and many of them remain in collector hands to this day, still pasted to the original ledger pages uh, that indicate their provenance from an official archive. So all of those, of course, were not intended uses uh, for, these, for these stamp distributions. A handful of postal operators, though, chose to give their UPU reference collections to museums. The General Post Office in London began donating them to the British Museum in 1914, and that collection still exists today and now resides at the, at the British Library. And similar transfers formed the basis of many of what are today the world's most renowned postal and philatelic museums, uh, including the Musée de la Poste in Paris, the Archive for Philately in Bonn, the Postal Museum in London, the Post Museum in Stockholm, and the postal museums in Madrid, Singapore, Portugal, Serbia, Russia, many other countries uh, I've been able to trace 
uh, still have these intact UPU uh, reference collections. Dan Daniel? Yes. Uh, you know, you've I'm sure you prepared beautiful slides, but unfortunately, we're stuck here on the first slide. I, I don't know if I, you're, you're, you're not stuck. I haven't moved the slide yet. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Please continue. <laughs> Some measure, I think, of the importance of these collections can be had by uh, reference to the time period in which they were transferred to these museums. The late 19th and early 20th century were the high watermark of nationalism, which had its origins in the Napoleonic era. And as a result, many of the postal collections and museums created in this period uh, were uh, intensely focused on domestic postal history. And the acquisition of these UPU collections um, brought a new transnational perspective uh, to these museums. This is a photograph uh, for, of the uh, philatelic collections at the Smithsonian Institution sometime in the 1920s uh, as they were displayed in the pullout frames. You can see the pages of stamps mounted on pullout frames and undoubtedly very many of those stamps that visitors were looking at in, uh, in the, uh, at the Smithsonian in the 1920s were, were the UPU specimen stamps. So exhibitions, public exhibition of these stamps organized by postal museums as well, helped to raise public awareness of the world as a single postal territory that was based on cooperation. Outside of a handful of buildings and monuments, as was discussed at some length yesterday, the Universal Postal Union had and continues to have in many countries a fairly low public profile. And so we can think of these UPU specimen collections that now reside in postal museums and capitals all around the world as paper monuments, as uh, 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 quiet reminders of the existence of the International Bureau and its work for, for well over 100 years. I think also the effect was that as museums began collecting worldwide stamps through these transfers, it helped to legitimize philately as a field of study. This was a status that was already enjoyed by numismatics at the turn of the 20th century, but uh, was, was not yet enjoyed uh, by philately. So what are we talking about? Here are some examples. The double head issue of Rhodesia from 1910. Here, these are the high values in the set of stamps <clears throat> showing, uh, uh, showing the king and queen. But if you can see this word specimen, printed vertically down the middle of each stamp. This is what we mean when we talk about distributions of UPU specimen stamps. Um, high values from the uh, from the reigns of Edward uh, uh, of uh, Edward the sixth or Edward the seventh rather and George the fifth. You can see the va face values of these stamps, you know, five hundred dollars straight settlements, five hundred rupees, one thousand rupees. It should be st stated that most of these very high value stamps were not issued for postal purposes, rather they were for collecting taxes. But um, these are uh, very expensive stamps in collector markets even today and for many museums. Uh, the only copies that they have of these, of these uh, very scarce stamps in their collection today are likely to be the UPU specimens that were distributed. Not all countries printed the word specimen on their stamps. Uh, here are some examples. All of, all of the stamps that I'm showing you uh, in, the, in these slides now are from the National Postal Museum's collection. Uh, but uh, Australia, rather than overprinting specimen or uh, using uh, that type of a mark to identify their stamps, simply neatly canceled them with a, a date stamp of Melbourne. And here's an example of a display page of the type that you saw in the photo of visitors looking at the pullout frames, uh, again from the museum's collection, uh, entirely composed of UPU specimen stamps. It was not just Britain and its colonies that uh, overprinted or identified its UPU specimen stamps. Here's an example from Mexico, the special stamp that was issued for the Amelia Earhart's goodwill flight to Mexico City in 1935, and the small word muestra here on the left, indicating that this is one of the stamps distributed in the UPU distributions. And 
uh, we still use these stamps in our exhibitions today. This is the current exhibition uh, in the William H. Gross Stamp Gallery at the National Postal Museum. And here are the specimen stamps on the wall. And you can see them perhaps here on the screen of this digital interactive and displayed next to Earhart's flight suit. The first airmail issue of China, 1921, the UPU specimen overprints are still on display in the museum's galleries today. Some countries, there's evidence in the collections that when UPU distribution started in, um, uh, in the 1870s, some countries actually went back and reprinted their earlier stamps. This is a stamp of New South Wales issued in 1861, but it's mentioned in the UPU distribution circulars and overprinted here with the specimen overprint, indicating that New South Wales, uh, at least, went back and reprinted their older stamps in order to make sure that all the member nations had a complete set. Uh, the colony of Netherlands Antilles, Curaçao, during World War I, when supplies of stamps ran low, they resorted to bisecting their stamps for use on mail, cutting, it's the collector term for cutting stamps in half, to use them on mail. And uh, amazingly, they were also distributed through the International Bureau, through the UPU, in this condition, and they remain in the Smithsonian's archives today, uh, as you see them here on the screen, uh, a strip of three stamps, each one very neatly cut in half. In some cases, a nation included a stamp in its UPU distributions that it then either never issued or changed the design or color of the stamp uh, when it was finally issued to the public. And so in some cases, color varieties and un otherwise unissued stamps exist in these archives that are not known at all uh, outside of institutional collections. It's the case with the, uh, the first issue of the Finland Republic shown here in unissued values and colors that were never released to the public, but they were in the UPU collection. St. Helena, 1903, distributed via the UPU in all red, as you see here at the upper left, but when it was finally issued to the public, uh, it was a bicolor issue. Same thing with the straight settlements, distributed, printed in red via the UPU, but when it actually went on sale at post offices, it was printed in ultramarine. The uh, sixpence issue for the abolition of slavery in Jamaica, uh, commemorating the anniversary of, of uh, that event, was withdrawn at the last moment, largely because of political and racial tensions in Jamaica at the time, and replaced with a totally different stamp, uh, as you see here at the lower right. So the only surviving examples of the unissued stamp uh, in, uh, are, are the uh, UPU overprints. This is an example of the circulars that accompanied the distribution of these stamps. And I chose this one because it, it traces the, the chain, if you will. Here's the upper left-hand corner, the corner card or the, uh, uh, the header of the International Bureau and the Universal Postal Union with the protocol number of this bulletin. Here's the stamp indicating the date, 19 January, 1912 the stamp indicating that it was received by the post office department in February of 1912, and then these magenta markings, accession, the black number 550009, and these, uh, the registrar stamp here are indications then of transfer to the Smithsonian Institution. So you can see the, the chain of custody. So that's just a quick look at the UPU specimen stamps and how they came to form the basis of a number of the world's postal museums. Um, and uh, my contact information, I'd very much like to hear uh, from anyone who uh, knows of official archives other than the ones that I've seen and reported on here. Uh, and, I, and I'd uh, encourage hearing from you uh, after the conclusion of the conference, but also during the questions and answer period. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that. And I would like to call uh, Jose to introduce the next speaker. Merci beaucoup, Christian. Nous allons passer de l'histoire des timbres à l'histoire de l'enveloppe. Thank you. 
Christian. So moving now to the history of envelopes, from the history of stamps to the history of envelopes. So um, Sebastian Riches um, is uh, going to is a specialist of uh, French post history, but now he's going to talk to us about the history of the envelope. So the floor is yours, Sebastian. Thank you, José, for your very enthusiastic uh, welcome. <laughs> so colleagues, the economic crisis of 2008, followed by the confinement of 2020, have accelerated the trend towards the increasing scarcity of mail, which had began with the democratization of the internet. For business, mail had become a financial burden that had to be reduced, and for all others, an obsolete means of exchanging information. As mail disappeared, so does another consubstantial, almost anonymous object, namely the envelope, which had celebrated its bicentenary a short while ago. As we approach the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, it seemed appropriate to explore a part of the history of this paper use stencil or tool, the new packaging for the written word through the prism of the UP, which is celebrating its 150th anniversary. So my presentation will be threefold. First, I will try to draw up an anatomical genealogy of the envelope. And, um, um, I would like to raise the issue of postal materiality in the discussion in this UN Senegal that welcomes us today, which began, for example, in the standards for postal parcels established in the early 1880s with the so-called international stamp. My second point is the major chronological milestones of the program, um, which will enable me to outline this diplomacy of the object and the method used, and uh, then um, the standardization um, of the envelope within the more global mail standardization program. So first, a uh, brief anatomical genealogy. It should be noted that while the work is done on the history of the packaging of packaging in France, the place of the envelope in the historiography is tiny. The Anglo-Saxon science identifies its origins in England, the country that has led the way in a number of postal advances in history. Uh, the idea of a special postal envelope is attributed to an Englishman, a bookseller and a stationary merchant living in Brighton by the name of Bruin, Brewer. In the early 1820s, at the time, it was a paper bag in the shape of a lozenge. Um, so, uh, with the corners curved into triangular flaps converging towards a common center. Uh, to seal the envelope, the flaps were closed with a wax seal. Uh, the first third of the 20th century saw a host of patents relating to the envelope registered in several countries in the Western world. They concerned the closing and opening of envelopes, protection of the letter, and practicality of use. Um, leading to the so-called rational envelope model. In 1929, the UP's journal, L'Union Postale, called for its distribution throughout the world. This was a rectangular, it was in a rectangular format, um, a paper bag already existing in the form of a, a paper sachet, which no longer required the letter to be stuffed inside, but simply to be slid folded in half through a slit on the narrower side, then closed by moistening and pressing the edge. No seams on the reverse to prompt the sender to stick the stamp there to seal it. And this is important because it uh, simplifies uh, checks, uh, mail checks. Um, so, while this rational envelope is a tool for improving productivity in office administration, since it facilitates dispatch and mechanization, it is not quite the answer to the major challenge facing the post offices in major countries. Um, because after 1945, they saw a period of a transition in the 1960s um, between the former dominant period of manual mail sorting at a rate of 1,500 to 2,000 letters per hour for the better post masters. Um, and the hope for future period of mechanically sorting 20,000 items an hour. Um, and this uh, method was still trying to find its first guiding principles. At the crossroads of the two models, the presence of envelopes of different sizes leads to an excess of operations that are detrimental to the streaming, streamlining of mail processing, the flow of which was growing by 6 to 12 percent a year in the West. For example, square envelopes complicate stacking, facing, and cancelling operations. 
In addition, the sorting machines that were being developed were designed to handle items that, that fell within certain size limits. So the uh, items that were too small or too large were already rejected. Above all, in a standardized postal format project, this would not mean the creation of a new special format, but would require overall cooperation for certain formats or groups of formats whose width and length um, for individual items uh, could not exceed certain limits. Now, uh, we have a clearer picture of the envelope and the tensions it engenders. Let's look at the chronology and the methodology used to standardize it. Uh, the Ottawa Congress in 1957 that um, Masi Bahu Mazu described as the Congress of Technology at the Service of the Post set up the Consultative Commission on Postal Studies, the CCEP, the forerunner of today's Postal Operations Council, and its board management. Together, these two interlocking bo bodies launched um, the project by making an informal assessment of the recommendations of the International Organization for Standard the ISA, to which I will uh, return. Uh, the report was discussed at three meetings in 1958 and 1959, which informed us that the ISA was already working on the formats of administrative papers um, of businesses or state um, administrations, and um, that the link with efficient postal envelopes would be desirable. And by setting up a technical working group called the AON, called the Standardization Letter Format Envelope, um, Letter Envelope Format, made up of the FRG. And um, this fir the first meeting was in Eastburn in 1960, resulted in two decisions, a framework for thinking about envelope limits between um, a limits based on two ideas, the width of between 90 and 120 millimeters and the length of between 150 and 230 millimeters. The length of the envelopes uh, should never be less than the width multiplied by the square root of two. And also, uh, Instauration d'un comité de contact. Secondly, the deci uh, second decision was expressed, um, namely the wish for collaboration with ISO recommending the establishment of a contact committee. So the first of its kind for the UPU, um, this technical collaboration uh, was the revolution uh, to bring to fruition a complex subject involving the measurement of ratios and cross-cutting economic issues. On the union side, the four posts of the economic powers are initially in charge of this rapprochement. French connections in this body's facilitate, facilitated rapid implementation. Paris hosted the first meeting of the contact committee in 1960. It was chaired by Marcel Faucon, director of General of the Post Office, who welcomed Henri Saint-Léger, Secretary General of the ISO. The ISO had already set up in Paris a standardization group called the TC6 Paper Standardization Group, dedicated to office paper. At the time, ISO, based in Geneva, was a young and small organization created in 1946 with 44 member countries that consisted mainly of uh, rich countries that were already technologically advanced. In all, um, uh, the contact community met three times between 1961 and 62, as did the ISO technical subcommittee TC6SC6 paper, in which UPU members now participated in parallel. It drafted the principles for the 19... Uh, the principles for the 1964 Vienna Congress, a key moment in the development of the program. First of all, the debates at Congress reflected the new porosity uh, established between the UPU and ISO in a technical meetings where each party contributed its own um, point of view and methods for uh, the UPU, a practical and endogenous method, which feeds the debate with the results of questionnaires sent to member posts uh, for the ISO, uh, theoretical and exogenous, which wants to link the subject of the wider issue of paper in the growing administrative and tertiary sector. And then um, among the first striking trends, there are the, the were first the abandonment of the idea of a single standardized postal format, which had initially been hoped for, and at the end of square formats, and then the initiative to opt for recommended preferred formats to member posts. However, this rapprochement between the uh, UPU, the elephant, and the mouse was not without its problems. The main one arose between 1962 and 1963 when ISO expressed regret that the new minimum format recommended by the UPU was not the, the one it recommended. And above all, um, 
uh, in Vienna, uh, Finland tabled an am amendment in 64 at, at the start of Congress. Um, its argument was consideration for the eco papers, uh, the um, paper ecosystem which would take a dim view of the obligation to modify its paper making machines and France, the Netherlands, Belgium and Switzerland all supported the Scandinavian approach. Um, Germany and the UK um, were opposed. Um, the United uh, uh, States remained on the sidelines even though it initially advocated less restrictive uh, sizes. Although um, the uh, Finnish amendment was initially rejected, um, in the, the C6 that was finally um, proceeded by, by proposal 1394 approved in a modified and not immediately binding form. So it was finally at the Tokyo Congress in 1969 that the new common standards for envelopes was made official. So the deadline for, was set for the 1st of October 1973, extending the transitional period instead of the original uh, date of 1st of October 1972, um, before the obligations were imposed on all members, which were reviewed one last time in 74 at the Lausanne Congress. Um, However, there were exceptions for business cards, another mignonette, as they were called, greeting cards in exceptionally f small format. And then this uh, Tokyo Congress uh, was opened by its chairman, Katsumina, Katsumi Soyama, um, marked the irrevocable technological inflection of postal issues with a universal dimension. Um, he and I quote, the post office cannot stand aside from progress despite flourishing, the flourishing of telephone and telegraph, radio and television. It is and will remain the most practical means of communication, the one most within everyone's reach. They must therefore be developed at an accelerated pace and on a large scale with view to generate progress. Um, in Tokyo, with regards to postal technologies, uh, six a meeting before the Congress uh, was held in Geneva in 72. And on that occasion, um, other um, matters were dealt with in working groups, um, leading to massive mechanization and automa automation. So, for instance, with regards to the position of the address of the um, of the the sender, the um, sorting of letters, uh, standardization of typewriter characters, dimension and positioning of window envelopes, etc. So, the discussions were held with countries that were all involved uh, in the mechanization of uh, um, post uh, sorting. And then in Tokyo, there were two new uh, interlocutors with a direct interest in mail standardization that uh, um, made themselves known, the International Chamber of Commerce. And the second one, the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, created in 1947 as a forum for pan-European cooperation, which was particularly interested in seeing how the mail standardization program fit into east-west West development relations. So, in conclusion, and I'm sorry, I will um, go over the last minutes that I'm um, that I still have. Uh, so, yesterday's panel was uh, very interesting, but my I've used mainly printed archives found here at the UPU from the Technical Committee of the Contact Committee and. On several occasions, I contacted ISO that um, emphasized that it didn't have any uh, archives or documents on this uh, huge program to standardize the mail, which I find very suspect, I must admit. And then 
We also need to identify a general scope as it relates to the fields of history um, through the prism um, of the study of these globalizing objects. It seems that the standardization of envelopes in the male object during the 1960s and 1970s 70s had the same impact as the harmonization of the standardization gauge of rails in Europe. Introduced in 1922 under the aegis of the International Union of Railways, it was intended to ensure the continuity of transcontinental convoys. Uh, this meant that the vehicle for trade, be it a a written package or other could be received everywhere by domestic network so that it could continue its transit as quickly as possible. I'd also like, um, I can also see three particular short term implications linked to the mail ecosystem. The first is the confirmation for a postal object other than the parcel or the stamp that the conduct of this global mail standardization program had underpinned the institution's capacity for consensus, overcoming initial disagreements through a good-natured multilateralism that does not coerce but suggests and guides within the framework of long time frames in order to achieve convergence. This uh, second identifies the work on envelopes as the cornerstone of the male standardization uh, program. It was in this way during the 1970s uh, for the main developed countries that the postal industrial era came to fruition. Um, for instance, in France, uh, the best, uh, the first automatic mail sorting center opened in 73. Uh, this brings us back to the origins of the UPU and its first founding project, standardization of the envelope and the standardization of mail constitute a sort of completion of the three free international transit of mail to which the member states were formerly subject, and which is now made even easier by the convergence of uh, mail formats and formulas. Uh, finally, uh, this also reflects a new era for the UPU, which is convinced of the need for an external collaboration with other technical and supranational organizations that had not been considered postal operators, uh, the ISO-UP relationship with regard to the format of envelope was to prove conducive to a continuation along the same lines, followed by an extension to other postal and peri-postal subjects, such as the definition of the standard for the alphabetical and numerical codes of country names in which the UP was to participate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sebastian, and uh, also for keeping time. Uh, we uh, move now from the big where we started, which was with the stamps of the late 1800s, early 1900s. We we moved through the innovations and standardizations of the envelope in the middle of the 20th century, and we now move to the 1980s and a time when it became clear that a digital substitution was underway. This was the decade for the our younger audience up here. That was the decade when the personal computer came about, started entering the workplace first and also slowly uh, private homes. It was the decade when the first mobile phones uh, came onto the market. It was still rare. Very few ha people had them, but you had one, Jose. Oh, okay. They were quite big as well. We have to say, yeah, we call them mobile, but it was more like a big box. You were, about. yeah. Um, and and it was also the time when I think it became clear there was the Telefax. Who can remember the Telefax? Uh, this was quite something. So it became clear that there were uh, new ways of communicating, and the big question was, of course, how would this affect uh, the postal industry, the postal sector? And so it's a pleasure to uh, welcome our third speaker, Dr. Christian Franke from the University of Siegen in Germany. He is joining us online. And he will talk about the early response of UPU members to electronic messaging systems. So uh, Christian, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you see and hear me? We can see and hear you. Ah, uh, perfect. So I start with sharing my screen. 
Um, so where is it? Where is it? Wait a minute. I don't see my presentation. It worked perfectly at the test. Okay, so you see my presentation? Okay, can yes, you see? So we see your slides, yes, all okay, good. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, let me take the opportunity to thank the organizers uh, for having invited me uh, to this very interesting and uh, conference, which I think I'm one of the last ones um, to speak and it was a pleasure to join even though it was only online and I apologize for only having been able to uh, to take part in this conference online but we had a family emergency and so I had to stay at home and um, currently I'm in parallel presenting and taking care of my children so if you hear a children's voice in the next 50 minutes uh, just ignore it. Okay, so my topic is nothing can replace the post-electronic mail and the UPU in the 1980s. Nothing can replace the post. The UPU demonstrated with that motto at the Universal Postal Congress in Hamburg in 1984 that it positively approached the future, even in the 110th year of its existence. Its members did not expect electronic mail services to compete seriously with traditional letter mail in the foreseeable future. My presentation today takes a closer look at the UPU's attitude towards electronic mail, so around from the 1970s to the 1990s. Questions are, why, when, and how did UPU and their member administration respond to electronic mail? How do the UPU's reaction to electronic mail fit into the long lines of trans-border postal services? It's important right from the beginning to underline that the UPU's Consultative Committee for Postal Services, or in short CCPS, was originally not responsible to standardize electronic modes of communication. This was done within the Consultative Committee for Telegraph and Telephone, CCITT, which was part of the International Telecommunication Union, ITU. Electronic mail services at that time were of very different character. They actually had a long history as the, the telegraph or the telex already transmitted written messages electrically since the 19th century. But characteristic for these older systems were low transmission capacity and a low demand. In the 1970s and 1980s, these conditions changed fundamentally. For postal administration, Electronic mail was a service where written messages were transmitted electronically, as you can see in the slide, and then printed out, enveloped, and delivered physically. Because of the combination of electronic and physical components, they were also called hybrid systems. 1977 must be seen as a milestone in the development of electronic mail systems, as the CCITT started to issue recommendations for the transmission of typewritten texts via digital tech networks. The postal administrations recognized that the digitization of telecommunication, the increased use of data networks, and computer communication would sooner or later raise the question of electronic mail. They asked themselves how to react to these new modes of information transformation. The German Bundespost, for example, carefully analyzed the market situation and concluded in 1977, and here I quote, in the Federal Republic, no concrete demand for electronic mail is perceptible. Just a few years later, a few postal administrations set up national pilot projects for hybrid mail systems like the Swedish Postfax system or the German Telebrief. These pilot projects in the early 1980s, however, confirmed the administration's reservation. In, eight, in 1982, for example, the German Telebrief delivered 29,976 mails or uh, 70,000 pages altogether in the domestic service, compared with 36 million letters that were delivered in Germany every day. So in the mid-1970s, 
Postal administrations in Europe mostly had such an effective distribution system that delivery within 24 hours was almost guaranteed. It was only international electronic mail services over very long distances that promised significant time savings compared to letter post and generated a demand which allowed a cost covering service. In 1980, Intel Post became the first such service between the USA, Canada, Great Britain and the Netherlands to deliver high quality reproductions of documents, pen and ink drawings or diagrams up to A4 size. Facing the actual economic importance of electronic mail services, the members of the UPU by majority refrained from an in-depth study of electronic mail systems. They preferred to discuss intra-system improvements like the automatization of letter sorting systems instead. The World Postal Congress in 1979 nevertheless instructed the CCPS, and here I quote, to draw attention to the need for postal services to follow closely the development of different forms of electronic mail. At its, next, at its next meeting, the CCPS decided to carry out study 503 on electronic mail and other advanced message systems. This German-led study 503 started its work by drawing up and distributing a questionnaire to the administrations to find out which types of electronic mail services were operated or planned by the national administrations. Aspects such as definitions, legal basis, transmission technology, posting, delivery, service organization, billing systems and charges were queried. A first summarizing report was then issued in autumn 1981. Three years later, at the World Postal Congress in Hamburg in 1984, the German Bundespost then recommended the instruction of the international the introduction of the International Electronic Letter Service, although the legal status of this new service was still completely unclear. Besides some initial discussion and recommendations, electronic mail services were at best a marginal issue at the World Postal Congress. Instead, Postal actors had learned from the long development since the 19th century that the different innovations in telecommunication, like the telegraph, the telephone, or the telex, never seriously challenged letter mail. The ITU's Standardization Committee, the CCITT, however, had already taken a first step in the direction of the UPU's International Bureau. UPU responded with exploring the institutional basis for cooperation. This took more than two years until a first preliminary meeting between UPU and ITU took place in November 1981. Both organizations agreed on much closer cooperation, although this had to be clarified in lengthy institutional coordination processes. Five years after the UPU had begun to discuss cooperation with ITU, a first official meeting took place in September 1984. Besides some loose and or informal contacts, Hardly any intense cooperation between both organizations had taken place before. Already a year before the UPU initiated the study 503, a working group of postal administrations, the so-called Paris Group, had been formed outside UPU. Its members met annually at electronic mail conferences to discuss developments. A technical committee and a committee for marketing and operations were set up to annually issue reports and recommendations for further action. A major problem was privacy of correspondence in hybrid mail systems, enveloping in the post offices as for protection of data privacy and quality of transmission. The Paris Group's members, which mostly already operated some kind of electronic mail service, carried out an important task, even though their work was largely ignored by UPU. The group in-depth studied electronic mail services at a time when the UPU just began to compile its questionnaires. The Paris group was the actual source for the revision of the CCITT recommendation F-170. It drafted the first guidelines for the selection of facsimile equipment for direct communication via public telephone networks. And it brought about concrete agreements for international services. For example, a common vocabulary, common basis of calculation, and a corporate identity of the Intel Post system. The Paris Group, however, 
had little direct influence on standardization of technical components of electronic mail services. The only way it was allowed to contact CCITT bodies was through national telecommunication administrations. So although the Paris group was much more advanced in the 1980 than the UPU in terms of expertise, it was nevertheless bound by institutional constraints while the UPU and the ITU already negotiated their cooperation. The years 1984 to 1986 can be regarded as a kind of critical juncture because technologies had developed rapidly while the majority of postal administrations and the UPU still reacted hesitantly. Between 1980 and 1984, technical advances in areas like closed data networks in companies, data transmission via fax or personal computers were numerous. One important aspect was the standardization of the Integrated Services Digital Network, ISDN which promised digital data transmission between terminal equipment in companies and private households by making use of the public telephone network. Here, for the first time, a structural change in the markets for mail transmission was looming, particularly in the IT sector. It was expected that through the use of electronic office machines like computer, an ever-increasing amount of mail would already be digital in its origin. And so the question of direct digital transmission would inevitably arise. Technical research played an increasingly important role at that time. Within the CCITT, it was regretted that the postal administrations on several occasions did not have a coordinated UPU attitude. A step in that direction was taken in May 1986, when the CCITT CCPS contact committee took up its work again with a delay of nearly two years. CCPS now even set up a permanent study group to monitor the work carried out jointly by CCITT and to merge the positions of the postal administrations into reports to be submitted to the CCITT on behalf of UPU. This group made the UPU the central institution on the postal side and devaluated the Paris group. Nevertheless, it had to rely on the work carried out in the Paris Group to fulfill its tasks. In spring 1987, UPU was only able to make a contribution to the ongoing standardization processes within CCITT because it forwarded studies that were prepared by the Paris Group's technical committee. These dealt with details of the design of service elements like modes of delivery, physical forwarding, undeliverable mail, addressing and the interworking between electronic components and physical delivery. These proposals were adopted as components of various drafts for new CCITT recommendations. Nevertheless, the postal administrations were in a position to give input for CCITT standards only in some marginal, non-technical aspects. The Swedish administration therefore voted for continued cooperation within the Paris group and argued that the UPU in the 1980s was not organized in such a way that it could effectively counter new competitors of technical innovations. And here I quote, the UPU has far too long a work cycle, usually five to seven years from the creation of an idea to its realization. For this reason, the development of new services is already taking place outside the world organization. The German Minister for Postal Services, Christian Schwarz-Schilling, shared this opinion and warned the UPU that, I quote, the post should not become the monopolist for slow mail. The study group 503 continued its work unimpressed by such criticism and consideration. According to its traditional procedures, the SGT 503 instead prepared a colloquium for all its members in October 1988 to discuss future strategies and developments without liability. Again, the group compiled an extensive survey of the range of electronic mail services offered by its members. The majority of UPU members saw no particular urgency because according to the pure figures, postal electronic mails did not yet have any remarkable influence on communication markets. UPU members could in the long run Imagine that one day it might be possible to reach anyone worldwide via fast communication channels. However, they expected that it would take at least 15 to 20 years 
until electronic mail services would be able to gain significant market shares. The spread of network computers into private households and the widespread availability of systems like the email was unimaginable for postal administrations at that time. Although the World Postal Congress in 1989 passed without further action by the UPU, however, at that period, the basic standards for digital networks and electronic mail services, which had a fundamental impact on postal services in the long run, were largely agreed without any recognizable involvement of the UPU. Up to the World Postal Congress in Seoul in 1994, Similar discussions were held on the operation of electronic mail services and model agreements for bilateral contracts were negotiated. This time, however, the breakthrough of the email could no longer be denied. And here I quote, a significant development of electronic mail services took place where 70% of letter post items are computer generated. For the first time, the, EP, the UPU now clearly stated that, and I quote, Electronic mail services are strategically important to the post. Just 10 years after the very self-confident nothing can replace the post at the World Postal Congress in Hamburg, even the delegation from Pakistan underlined that we have to meet this challenge by innovation and by technical expedience. Let us come to an end and draw a conclusion. A number of partially interdependent reasons made the UPU and its members react reservedly towards electronic mail systems in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The combination of a missing financial incentive with the historically grown expectation that innovations within telecommunications, like the telegraph, the telephone or telex, never seriously impacted postal services was crucial. UPU and its members could hardly imagine that electronic mail services would be able to become a competitor for letter mail. As long as electronic mail services were negligible in quantitative terms, the UPU and its members were only involved in the implementation of such services to a limited extent. When then the development of ISDN and new electronic message options emerged at the UPU, the UPU had to react unexpectedly quickly to the ITU's offer of cooperation in the second half of the 1980s. It was forced to fall back on the Paris Group study work, although it had ignored the Paris Group for a long time. The study group 503 devaluated the Paris Group through its ability to participate in the ITT. However, it was in the following unable to intervene similarly successful in the standardization of electronic mail. Nevertheless, it should be emphasized that the UPU could not have foreseen this change in the 1980s. Neither were its players experts in computers and digital networks, nor did the long-term experience with the new forms of electronic communication suggest the kind of change in communication routines that gradually occurred with the spread of email and internet. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all our three speakers also for keeping time so beautifully, which leaves us more than ample time for questions and comments from the room, including the gallery. Uh, if you wish to ask a question or, or give a comment, please raise your hands. And uh, we have a first speaker down here. Don't forget to turn on your microphone and, and speak into that. Yes, hi, Richard John from Columbia University in New York City, United States. Um, I have a, a comment and then a question. The comment is, now we've come to the present, and we're looking back on the history of the envelope, and we're looking back on the history of materiality of the mail. The posted letter is not going to be as important in the future as it was in the past, especially the distant past. And it may be that that heightens our understanding or our awareness of its enormous significance as an artifact for, among other things, the crafting of historical narratives, biography, administrative history. Um, postal monopoly 
is very important to the conception of the UPU. Yet in the most competitive markets today, at least from a U.S. perspective, parcel delivery, there's a lot of deals being cut between the post office and the delivery carriers, but it's a competitive market, whereas the UPU is organized around national monopolies. And that raises the question for what is the rationale for a national postal network, government owned or operated in the 21st century, where so much communication is going via platforms that, well, they're not coordinated by the UPU, as we heard from the last presentation, and it's not even clear about the extent to which they are government uh, owned and operated. So can the current moment cast light on the distinctiveness and the enormous significance of the posted letter as an artifact, raise questions about monopoly? And, and just finally, as a parochial US observation, the Postal Service was enormously important in the 2020 U.S. presidential election uh, because we were in the midst of a pandemic and an awful lot of ballots were mail-in, which became uh, controversial, which was in keeping with the mandate of the institution in the 18th century, but not suggested. I mean, not it was not something that would have been anticipated. So can we talk about the contemporary significance of the post Given the challenge of electronics, perhaps how does the current environment shed light on the enormous significance of, say, posted letter, even those wonderful, uh, those wonderful specimen stamps? Richard, uh, do you have a favorite person to uh, respond? Or well, I'd like I'd like uh, Frankie and uh, Sebastian, and then um, I'd really like to hear Daniel Piazza on the significance of postage stamps. I wasn't able to attend the philatelic session, but those specimens were just so startling. So really three speakers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. And and, and uh, in reverse order, you are. So Christian uh, Franke, would you like to have an attempt at uh, answering yeah. online? Okay, you, you still understand me? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, a complex question, which uh, um, which light this, uh, this the past through on the, on the present or the present on the past? Um, yeah. I, I think one one important point is that um, that letter mail is a kind of fallback option um, in in situations like like pandemics or in 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 situations where um, where ele electronic communications are. Well, well, there are there are currently we, we all know if we look at the international arena, we see that uh, that electronic communication is 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 in a in a very competitive situation. We have we have the BRICS states, we have China, we have Russia, which all do their own internets, their own communication channels. So um, I think having the having the letter mail in in, in the background is an is. Um, it's a backup with regard to what is what is facing us in in the near future. Okay, yeah, great, uh, Sebastian. Would you like to say a few words? Cher Richard, le, le sujet est si vaste, mais dear point... Richard, this is a very vast subject. But looking at it from a French perspective, the public principles of the post were built on the third in the third republic uh, to build a notion of citizenship we can add to this the concept of a market uh, for the parcel post post was a vehicle for that and then there were financial there are financial services i think that this is a moving history throughout the 20th century and evolving history, the post office in France had to rethink its public usefulness for uh, citizens and citizenship, uh, which has now become dematerialized while convincing itself that it has strengthened major uh, its major competitive services. I very much liked Mr. Frank's talk 
on electronic mail. The French post office has invented a public service electronic mail in 1982 and realized that individuals had no use for it, but that businesses would quickly appreciate this uh, means of delivering publicity and management uh, documents on management matters. So I learned that the UPU uh, was very reserved with uh, respect to the usefulness of uh, electronic mail. Let me ask Pascal Crisé, uh, did the French post office, which was part of the posts and telecommunications at the time, did that help the French post postal service to uh, wake up more uh, earlier? The, has the French Postal Service realized that mail volumes were going to decline since the 80s? It was no surprise from what I've been able to see in the French archives. Thank you very much. And perhaps, uh, Daniel, would you like to... Uh, are you still with us, Daniel? I um, am, yes. Excellent. Do you have anything to add? Yes. Hello, Richard. Good to see you. Um, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I, if, if, you know, we regard stamps as artifacts and ask the question then in, in an age in which their ubiquitousness is sort of, is sort of passing away or, or diminishing, you know, then, then how do we um, find new significance and distinctiveness about them? I think in, in academics, I mentioned one of the roles of the UPU specimen stamps was kind of legitimizing the field of philately as something that was collected and exhibited by national museums. Um, I think in the we, what we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years is academics finding a lot of new meaning and significance in old and new postage stamps by looking at the iconography and the semiotics of these stamps in a in a in a critical way. Um, I think for postal operators, that is the, the people who actually design and issue these stamps in most cases, uh, I think they still carry a lot of potential for uh, political and public service type messaging that uh, you know, a number of countries have used. Uh, it's very disconcerting seeing myself on a giant screen. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, you know, they, they've, I, I think they still continue to issue stamps and will continue to issue stamps because it has that potential. And also, in a, the, uh, for a lot of places, especially emerging nations, developing nations, um, I think they still provide a function, a role, both for the producer and the user in terms of construction and imagination of national identity. Um, symbolisms and 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 those sorts of things so um so the they because stamps continue to be issued in huge numbers if the use if the use is not primarily postal and we take as it as a granted that there's a collector market yes what beyond that i think those three things are are are, are sort of new relevancies or discoveries that people are making by by through appraisal of you know academic appraisal of stamps Thank you very much. And Jose, you have something to add? Jose Anson? I think it's on. Je ne sais pas si vous... Oui, vous m'entendez bien. Non, Can you hear me? Yes, just a word about the monopoly and the UPU. There are many countries in the world, especially EU countries, that liberalized their mail markets long ago. That has not reduced the relevance of the UPU as an organization. Uh, postal services are collaborating even more. The end of monopolies may even have increased the need for cooperation between postal services. So I don't think there's a strict I don't know if there's a strict correlation between monopolies and needs the need to cooperate. It's just the framework that changes, the type of collaboration that evolves, and which today is an invitation. Uh, and today there's an invitation for wider players to come into the circle. 
to add something myself, actually. I'm standing here reflecting on, on this question, and I think it's a very interesting question. It, what I take from it is how the present illuminates the past, in a sense, and how, you know, what reflections can we have? One reflection that has come out of all of these sessions in this conference has been the problem of actually sourcing data, sourcing historical data. Uh, we had some examples in, in our, uh, our um, presentations here in this session, specimens uh, that were destroyed, the international standards organization that can no longer locate uh, any meeting minutes or, or whatever documentation artifacts to actually illuminate our understanding of, of you know, what, what happened in these discussions. And interestingly, these were, uh, these were discussions taking place in the UPU, in ISO, and other organizations that were fairly open organizations, uh, organizations um, based really around diplomacy, based around open discussions of things like standards and, and how do we operate and so on. It seems to me that this point, if, if we already have a problem, you know, approaching our sort of not too distant history with these organizations and identifying artifacts, what will the future look like? Uh, what's it going to look like in 20, 30, 50 years when historians want to understand decisions around communication? Uh, that take place today. And one of the big problems that I see is that I would say there's been some discussion about the monopoly or, or the role of government in communication. I think it would be wrong to assume that government um, governments don't play any role in communication today. Yes, some of the actors may be private actors, Google and, and so on, Meta and, and all of these big uh, uh, organizations that we know of. But behind the scenes, we also are perfectly aware that government agencies are actually doing a lot. However, these are hidden government agencies. And, and I would worry that in the future, uh, future historians are going to have a very tough time knowing exactly you know, who was talking to who, what organizations were involved in which ways. Um, and, and, and yeah, Richard, you want to? Two quick follow-ups. There's a good literature now on early modern economic development, East India Company, the company's state. We're challenging the idea of the public-private government versus corporation. It's not clear to me that Google or Facebook are private. Uh, they're doing the things, some of the things that governments have been doing. So I think we need to get beyond that binary, because I think that's going to confuse us and that's going to open up possibilities. For example, why not go back to turn and tax us? Why do we start with the national monopoly post offices, which has been an implicit assumption in our discussion? And second, history is not the past. And so much of history, at least in the parts of the world I'm familiar with from the early modern period on is organized around posted letters. It is just such an enormously basic fact about archives. Biography comes out of posted letter. Diplomatic history comes out of posted letter. It's such a fundamental existential reality. And we're now in a world in which the posted letter, as we understood it, is no longer as central as it was even in the 1980s. Um, and I just think this may be a way to, to think about, say, the Republic of Letters and the UPU. How enormously important that was when religious confessions made it impossible for, say, young people or even Descartes or other scientists to, to communicate across boundaries. They could do it through mail, um, communicate in different ways. I just think this raises questions that because of the wonderful final presentations on how different the world is today, which I think we all recognize, about what was it that's so essential about not only letter mail, but the posted letter as an artifact.
that's really what I'm trying to get the attention on. Yeah, and I'm that's not- a great thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from the audience? We do have yes, Walter. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> to introduce myself, I'm the chair of the consultative committee the new consultative committee and not the old consultative committee that was several times on the screen. So I'm representing the wider postal sector players. Um, One question to the gentleman from the Smithsonian. Um, We heard all about these beautiful stamps, stamps, duties, and so on, but parallel to some of those specificians, there was another very technology-driven development spearheaded by the US that was the invention of franking meters. So the first targeted destruction of stamps. Um, So um, um, that was the first um, introduction. And uh, of course, parallel to that development in the US, um, in Europe, there was another company with exactly the same idea. They were not linked to each other. It was Francotide Postalia. um, And uh, that had a tremendous effect, not only on stamp production, but on the whole um, technology um, first step into what we have seen in emergent technologies. Um, How was that um, organized? Um, There were, of course, then national standards to start with, and that evolved to global standards, I guess. And in the end, the franking meters disappeared and there was something new coming, like electronic postmarks. And again, the US had a leading role there. Um, to my understanding, the United States Postal Service was the first postal service ever to allow remote printing of postage marks. Um, I would be very interested if Daniel could, could look into that or if he has some ideas about that. Thank you. Daniel? Yeah, just, uh, uh, I mean, a few sort of random thoughts and responses. I think some of the earliest examples of meters and meter impressions that we have in the Smithsonian collection anyway, are from Norway and Sweden, Um, maybe at about the same time or possibly even a little bit earlier than the United States. Uh, So, or one of these things that sort of sprang up in multiple places at about the same time. Um, To your uh, to your question about yeah how they were standardized and organized yes it was in the beginning it was very hyper local um, I mean to, if you had if you I mean you had to apply for permission to have one of these meter machines uh, once you had permission to have one of these meter machines you actually had to bring it into the post office uh, to have the, the the postage value added. You know, pay a hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, and that would actually have to be added onto the machine mechanically at the post office. You periodically had to bring the machine in for inspection, um, and in, this is all in the United States, which is the context, of course, that I'm the most familiar with. Um, and the ability to add value and postage to the meter machines remotely probably doesn't come around until the 1990s um, in in the United States anyway. Um, Yeah, I I imagine that the trajectory is the same in most other countries, even if the dates are are slightly different. Uh, But but for the first 50 or 60 years, I mean, they were, those meters were under the jurisdiction, not just of the post office department, but the local post office. And you actually had to physically bring the meter into the post office at, at, at regular intervals. Thank you for that uh, interesting uh, reminder of uh, both of you, uh, of, uh, of some of the other technologies that have actually uh, played a role here. Excellent. I think uh, I would uh, suggest that we stop this uh, session here and let's, uh, before we we welcome um, Muriel Leroux and Léonard Laboury, our uh, chief scientists uh, of this this entire uh, conference, who will give a little uh, conclusion to the event. Before that, I would suggest we give a round of applause to our speakers.
Merci beaucoup. Donc, nous allons. Thank you very much. We are not going to come to the conclusion of this symposium. The children from the neighboring school have been very quiet, very attentive. Some of the things were probably difficult for you to understand, but I saw some of you taking notes. As so I don't know whether the teachers have uh, all seen an examination after this morning's presentations, but congratulations to the children for having been so attentive. So uh, for topics uh, that uh, are somewhat uh, austere and, and complex, uh, technically speaking, I don't know whether the teachers would like to stay. You can leave the room if you wish if you wish to. So we're not going to come to the scientific conclusion. So we have two speakers, two friends and colleagues from CNRS. who are going to provide these scientific conclusions. who are going to summarize what was done over the last couple of days. Tell us what conclusions they have drawn. And then we will have a few words by Marianne Oswald, Deputy Director General of the UPU International Bureau. Isaac Mambo is here, uh, President of the Council of Administration and also President of the uh, Post of Côte d'Ivoire. Isaac, thank you very much for being here this morning with us. So I'm going to give the floor now to our two colleagues, Muriel and Leonard, and then Mr. Oswald will say a few words of conclusion. Before giving them the floor, I would like to say that uh, all of the participants are invited to join a photo session outside this room after the closing speeches in front of the glass windows. We'll have a group photo over there. And uh, the photos of this historian's uh, colloquium uh, will be available on our website. We've also uh, recorded everything that was said. The acts are going to be published uh, shortly. We will contact, of course, uh, all of the speakers to get uh, their green light. So I give you the floor now for your concluding remarks, Muriel and Leonard. So we have come, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, to the end of this uh, historian's colloquium, achieving a single personal territory, a global promise past and present. Whether you're a practitioner or an academic, well, you know that uh, such colloquia and conferences uh, consist of two parts. There uh, is the part in the room, what is said in plenary, and then there is the part outside of the room uh, during the coffee breaks. And we are going to share the work. I'm going to draw some conclusions regarding what was said in this room. And then uh, Muriel will tell us what happened outside of this room during the coffee breaks behind the scenes. Well, what could I say as a conclusion? I would say that for my part, I would say that there are six points that stand out milestones, questions. The first point might make you smile. It's somewhat anecdotal. It's the a tram accident yesterday morning that meant uh, that we were deprived of a coffee break. And this uh, accident reminds me of another accident uh, that uh, took place in 1874 the data that has been mentioned so many times over the last couple of days. Well, a train accident at the time uh, prevented the French delegation from arriving in Bern. 
Two French Post delegates uh, were injured and had to return to France, which means uh, that uh, it was necessary to modify uh, the French delegation at the very last moment. So much for that uh, anecdote. And uh, this brings to mind two ideas. First of all, what is uh, the uh, Universal Postal Union? It is uh, the regrouping of meeting of men and women who come together to talk about a certain number of issues in much the same way as we've come from uh, the various parts of the world to speak to each other. In this type of event, uh, uh, some accidents may occur, technical and other. So when we try and have an overview of uh, the history of an organization such as UPU, it is necessary to take into account those material conditions, technical conditions, often IT conditions. And I have in mind uh, uh, the work done by our colleagues, uh, simultaneous interpreters. So this has an impact on the way the exchanges take place. We haven't really talked about uh, this uh, technical aspect of cooperation, which is part and parcel of the topic. The other idea that comes to mind is that there is a very strong link between the post and transport. Uh, postal services are used of various transportation means, uh, railroad, uh, planes, uh, boats. And uh, these trains, boats, and planes may not have uh, evolved uh, taken off so quickly in the case of the planes uh, if it had not been by the post. The sectoral post uh, provided tremendous backing uh, to these various forms of transportation that made it possible uh, to transport mail by air, by sea, by rail. So the postal sector there played a very important role in terms of uh, backing these various industries and enabling them to take off. That was my first point. The second point now, why have we come together over the last couple of days? Well, we're celebrating uh, 150 years of uh, the formulation of a pledge or of a promise. So 150 years, there's no doubt there. 9th of October, 1874, that is not under discussion, which is not always the case in other uh, international organizations. Last year, WMO celebrated its uh, 150th anniversary too. But uh, we should remember that it was necessary to have a resolution in 1967 uh, to set the official date of birth of that organization. There are various uh, dates uh, that were bandied about, and as regards to the uh, very beginning, 1853, 1873, 1879, nobody was really sure. And uh, so there was some uh, discontinuity from the historical standpoint, including uh, the uh, change of status of WMA, which initially was non-governmental, the World Meteorological Organization, before becoming intergovernmental in 1950. Everything is much clearer with the UPU. There is only one date, 1874. And since that date, uh, the organization has uh, kept its status of uh, intergovernmental organization. The date might have been different. The first Congress was organized in 1873. France and Russia had said that they wouldn't participate in this organization. So it was necessary to postpone the date for a year. For a year. But uh, since October 1874, the signatory countries and the members of the International Bureau have given life to this intergovernmental international organization, which has succeeded in adapting to a changing world. As regards uh, the second part of my sentence, uh, one single postal territory, a promise, a pledge. 
This is why we have come together. This is why the post operators came together in 1874. As regards to the title of this historian colloquium, this is what we said, achieving a single postal territory, a global promise past and present. Uh, the French ambassador uh, yesterday spoke about a dream necessary to keep this dream alive of a borderless uh, communication. And there we can see a certain ideology in this a promise of having one single uh, postal territory and having a mail uh, that can circulate uh, freely across borders. This was called uh, infrastructural globalism by a U.S. Uh, historian. And uh, here we're talking about an ideology where infrastructure, communication and transport in particular have to integrate the world, that the world has to be integrated, has to be united through these networks. So 1874 is certainly a revolution moving from an old postal regime to a new postal regime. I will not mention the names of each of the speakers over the last couple of days for a lack of time, but uh, we saw very clearly that uh, the classical narrative is moving from a chaotic uh, former postal regime, exchange of mail, to a new rational regime, much better organized and stabilized. I would like to be somewhat disruptive uh, this afternoon regarding this narrative and questioned the underlying ideology behind this pledge or this promise, whatever you may wish to call it. The main idea that I would like to introduce here is that there was certainly not one uh, solution to achieve postal progress. In 1874, one solution was chosen, one way, one cause to follow, but others could have been easily chosen at the time. And was the situation that chaotic before 1874? I do believe uh, that uh, other work uh, would be necessary to analyze what happened at the time. There was a first a democratization of correspondence in the 18th century. This uh, democratization uh, could not have occurred if there had been such a chaotic uh, situation, if it had, uh, was not possible uh, to have uh, uh, correspondence, mail correspondence over the borders. It was recalled that uh, communities uh, of uh, researchers, of politicians, of religious leaders relied on the postal sector before 1874. So we need to revisit uh, this idea that uh, prior to 1874, it was chaos. There were transnational operators thrown in Texas. Was that chaos? There were bilateral tra treaties that begin that were signed between national postal services <laughs> and the world after 1874 was that the only possible world is there only one form of rationalization probably not this reminds me of another change that has always been presented as obvious and the only possible solution, and that was the creation of national markets. Before the French Revolution and after the French Revolution, there was a major change, which was the creation of the country as a market without any internal borders, with no toll gates. We now know that the establishment of this national market was the result of a vision, a representation of the world in which homo economicus, the economic agent, had to be able to maximize his utility without constraint. This vision of the world, this, and one of the papers showed this clearly, in speaking about the importance of uh, colonial experience. 
this abstraction, which is uh, the uniform national tariff, and the other abstraction, that is the idea of a global postal network based on uniform rules, is the fruit of a representation of the world, which is the open playground for an economic player who has been freed, released from a number of obstacles. But behind these obstacles, these weights and measures, uh, variable as they may be, these p national postal systems, which are greatly variable, there were powers and interests at stake and at play. So, Uh, and things were very much influenced by this. I've got a few final points. The aim that we set ourselves was to gain a better understanding of the organization. I think we have achieved that to a certain extent uh, through this uh, symposium. We could continue thinking about the history of the U uh, UPU in pairs of things which I prefer to see as loops. We have the cooperation and competition hub or pair, the technical political binome or pair, the multilateral bilateral pair, the symbolic and material pair, the postal world and the rest of the world, we could think about the history of the organization with respect to these terms that are like two opposite poles. But I would prefer to see it, as I said, as a loop, because these two terms are never uh, predefined and they influence each other mutually. Cooperation and competition, for example, I know the time is short, but in actual fact, the, in the postal union, the very terms of cooperation and competition change their meaning. Bilateral and multilateral change meaning uh, according to what's happening in the union. Our other aim was that we wanted to postalize globalization, and I think we definitely achieved our aim there. We've seen how the opening of a post office, which uh, seems to be quite trivial, resulted in the forced op opening of a territory to world trade. Zanzibar, China, Brazil might be included in this group, Japan as well. So globalization, that is uh, the intensification of trade, which was not always something that uh, the parties involved wished for, well, the post played an important role in that. We've also seen that the Postal Union has been a place of subversion of this uh, informal imperialism, and we've discussed this at great length with variable results, Japan, the Ottoman Empire, China uh, had great hopes when they joined the UPU and were disappointed for a number of years because their sovereignty was not necessarily recognized. We also wanted to transnationalize the history of national posts and stop talking about the history of the post as it was just, uh, as if it was bound inside the national boundaries. We understand that Every morning, every evening, these uh, posts were important in households with their symbolism. They were associated with the idea of citizenship in many countries. But we must realize that they built up, they were built up through exchanges amongst themselves. And this is the aim of transnationalizing uh, national posts. The nation was built through exchanges and the posts were one of the uh, transnational vectors of this. It was a co-production. My final point 
is actually an appeal. Uh, I think this is going to feed in quite well to what Muriel is going to say, that the UPU should continue to be a place where professional historians and historians uh, working within postal operators, for postal operators or in museums. We hope that the union can continue to be a place where this community can meet regularly. We realize now that we've organized this symposium that there are historians working for postal operators who have a historic, some of them have a historical mission and who would like to further develop their knowledge uh, for their employers. We know that there are museums working on this and historians who can work on these subjects in and for museums. And uh, independent historians and these three groups are working in parallel on this history. And we hope that the regular meetings of these groups can take place within the union. Thank you. Muriel, let me give you the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, attendees of the Congress, uh, Director General, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Universal Postal Union, members of Posts, Jean-Paul Jean Forceville, Elizabeth Massonet, on behalf of the historians and participants gathered here, I uh, would like to extend a warm word of thanks for having hosted us here in Bern in these August halls, which, as we now know, are uh, celebrating their 150th anniversary. On behalf of the historians, I would like to thank the technical team of the UPU for their expertise. We tend to forget the people who are behind, sitting behind the windows or in booths, but who have been very instrumental in ensuring the smooth running of this symposium. Uh, and I include the interpreters in this, the interpreters who have made it possible for we academics to work in exceptionally good conditions. I have to say that it's very rare that we are able to speak our native tongue in symposia. And uh, Leonard and myself would like to be able to work with you again so that we can have such good conditions for our meetings. I would like to pay a special tribute to a number of persons uh, amongst whom uh, I must first mention Sebastian Richez, who of uh, is sort of the reference point for our the linchpin of our French delegation. We owe him a lot uh, in the organization of the symposium, but also his enthusiasm and passion that have infected all of us, have been infectious to all of us. Sebastian sees everything as a potential uh, field of research, as you heard him say this morning, he's passionate about envelopes, but uh, he is also very good in other technical subjects. I can't thank everyone, but I would like to say a word about the scientific committee, some of whom are still present in the room, Eric Godelier and Pascal Grise, among others were constant companions who uh, made it possible for Léonard Laborie, the linchpin of the uh, symposium, to defend a thesis on European communications relations a thesis that was vigorously supported by the Committee for the History of the Posts. And let me now mention a specific 
characteristic of uh, the French Post. We have a number of officials who feel it's important above and beyond museums uh, 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 and people in uh, to have people in other fields, transport and the universities to be work to be collaborating, uh, as Philippe Val said, with the National Scientific Research Council, the CNRS. Without this broad cooperation, this uh, symposium would not have taken place. And when André Darigrand in 1995 ex expressed a wish to see the Committee for the History of the Post uh, to be reborn, no one sitting at the table would have put any money on us being able to organize a symposium here in Bern on the 150th anniversary of the Universal Postal Union. So why has the Post uh, and the UPU to a certain extent remained so rarely visible in the work of historians uh, until the mid-1990s? Well, the history of the Post is all everything and nothing. It's the history of communications, of exchanges of territories. It can be a history of territories, communications and exchange. You can see it either way. We understand that when we talk about connections and when these connections are based on something which is so important as technolo uh, technology, women, the men and women who are behind these exchanges, various fields and types of approaches must be brought to bear. With constant support uh, from a French uh, company, a collection was established uh, some years ago. It's the collection of uh, work that is published by a Swiss publisher be because uh, the Peter, Peter Lang publishing house is uh, located here in Switzerland. So when you want, as was our aim at the outset, to take a European approach before you have a transnational and global approach, it, it, it's uh, important to start this way. Since 1995, work been, that has been carried out on the history of the post or posts, do, do we want to say the post as a singular, as a generic term, or should we uh, start at grassroots level and use posts? I will leave that up to you, and I will leave you to think about this question. Whatever the case may be, the Committee for the History of the Post has striven, uh, strived with uh, our Italian colleagues. And at this stage, I would like to remiss, uh, thank uh, Mr. Giuntini, who is a long-standing uh, friend of the committee, and also André Tissot, who is professor at the University of Neuchâtel and is an uh, old traveling companion in our international approach to history of the art of the post. Bring us to think together today about the Universal Postal Union. Does it represent the post, its idea, its ideal, as Sebastian said, or does it represent posts with a national uh, postal service in each country. It was very important for us that this symposium take place because in the mid-1990s, when we suggested to our students, our doctoral students, that they might delve into research about the post or the posts uh, and the Universal Postal Union, uh, I won't tell you, uh, I can tell you that Pascal Grise said, one of our students said, that's not fun, it's not sexy. Why would we want to work on uh, 
dusty, uh, musty subject like the post. But it's because the post office is such a fixture in our landscape, in our daily lives, that we had to argue with young historians that it was important to take an interest in the organization. It's such a firm fixture in our societies that we tend to overlook it. We tend to think it's banal and unworthy of academic work. Of course, we were not the first ones to work on it. But I think the real question is an epistemological one. Why is the post or the posts a transnational entity, the Union, the Universal Postal Union has, why have so few academics been interested in it? Well, because it's difficult. It's difficult for many reasons. The first of which is, and we mentioned this yesterday, we even had a full panel on it, is uh, a, to do with the archives, which are where the documents which we need to write up our work are found. Archives are not centralized. The UPU has its own archives. But for the Postal Union, there are also the delegates, uh, the national archives. How can we write a, the global history of a universal postal union, which is in its very essence transnational, when in order to synthesize this knowledge, you need to, as Sabrina said, I think, I think it was Sabrina, you have to visit 11 national archives and 16 um, repositories. And that's a minimum. So this approach to history requires a, an approach uh, that starts with the major organization, but it's also a, a work that is a long quest for everything that has to do with thinking about conservation correspondence. If you want to understand how the UPU works, you need to have access to all of the correspondence and forms of correspondence between the delegates and not just uh, the nice postcard photos like the ones we received yesterday. So the history is difficult to tackle because it also means that you need to be uh, multilingual. If you're working on a transnational institution, you need to speak two, three, four, or perhaps a hundred languages. And so this history is a collective effort to establishing this history is a collective effort. I'm not saying that individual efforts are not needed and not important. Uh, as Leonard said, we uh, have to tackle it from the top and from the bottom, and it must be the mirror image of the organization. Only historians as a group can find answers to the questions that have been raised during these two days. So it is necessary to look at this uh, from above uh, to be able to understand uh, the organization as a whole and as uh, some colleagues uh, indicated including our african colleagues uh, it is necessary to study very carefully the role played by the various uh, actors that we're able to collect uh, the testimonies of the uh, people who would be prepared to hand over those testimonies. Uh, this requires also upstream a reflection by a UPU to be able to uh, compile uh, these uh, testimonies and make them available publicly. So there is a social usefulness in the work of the historians who take an interest in 
the Universal Postal Union. And why do I say this? It is that if we make it known to the public at large and to historians, researchers, what is the modus operandi of this organization, what we want is for them to uh, think about uh, the relationship uh, between an organization and the technical aspects uh, that have been discussed. We uh, need also to reflect on uh, the relationship uh, between the organization, technologies, and economic systems, and systems of exchange. And we're all convinced of the fact uh, that uh, we're talking about uh, tools for exchange, tools for communication. How, why, when, what were the impacts at different times of the organization's history? Why were such and such uh, decisions uh, taken at a given time uh, that had an impact uh, on the evolution of societies to which we belong? So, sources are very important and uh, testimonies as well. All of this has to be preciously maintained and preserved. We also need to keep in mind the many players who are active in the way this organization operates and who are also active in their various respective national companies and that provide support to this organization. I'm not uh, thinking so much of the elite uh, that has been mentioned uh, several times. Um, I'm thinking of women who play a very important role in the very functioning of uh, the postal sector. Uh, amongst uh, the employees of the French postal sector, we find a majority of women, and they outweigh by far their male colleagues. And it would be interesting to know what the situation is in other post offices of other countries and also at UPU. What role did they play in the past when they took part in the postal congresses that were mentioned? And in the history of science, which is one of my passions, what about uh, the invisible people, all of the technical staff that make it possible uh, for such uh, an organization to function? And I think in particular of the translators and interpreters, uh, as well as uh, the uh, people who draft texts uh, to try and arrive at a common language. Who wrote what? And when? How is it possible to draw up a treaty within the, the UPU with the translation problems? So we're talking about the transposition of European law into national or domestic laws. And it would be interesting to know what the situation was within UPU. How were the decisions taken by UPU translated at the national level in the various member countries? What were the relationships between the, the various actors? So I think you will have understood that we have a responsibility as historians to ask a, a number of questions, and we need to awaken our students to the importance of these matters. There are arduous questions that have to be examined legal questions in particular that are often austere. Of course, we have these major treaties, but then there is the issue of transposition and adaptation in national laws. We heard uh, presentations on the Arab world, on China, Japan, Brazil, and we realized, uh, listening to those presentations, uh, that it was not obvious to have one single post office or to draw up the history of one single post office. The vision is much more complex than that. It is a wonderful puzzle with many pieces that have to be brought together. And for this reason, it is necessary to 
examine these uh, various aspects uh, that make up the history of UPU. Of course, after these uh, two days, uh, we uh, need uh, to ask the question of what exactly is uh, UPU. We were told that it was a transnational uh, or intergovernmental technical agency that was 150 years old, an agency part of the UN family, and as such uh, did not uh, involve itself in politics. Well, I disagree somewhat with uh, that uh, assumption or assertion. We're talking about a technical agency of the UN. For this reason, it's not surprising that uh, AUPU played a very important role in uh, diplomatic uh, uh, discussions and in political realms. We are talking about uh, the proper functioning of a democracy. How can you ensure a good transmission of uh, information? How can you ensure the reciprocity of exchanges, be they uh, political or private? And here I'm talking about correspondence or public with the press. If we disagree with uh, uh, the very meaning of uh, the reciprocity of uh, exchanges. Uh, this is a major theme, a major pillar of a political theory, as we see it in Europe as of uh, the middle of the 19th century. So where they were talking about uh, a free trade or the free movement of goods and persons, I think it is useful to recall that uh, the Universal Postal Union was a benchmark, a reference, which has always been extremely useful for the international community. Uh, the respect uh, for uh, proper correspondence uh, is uh, incumbent upon states who have a certain responsibilities in this regard. Uh, there's the transport of letters and packages, parcels. This is something that is very important. Uh, we're talking about the transmission of uh, goods, and today the transmission of uh, data. Following what was said in one of the presentations of this morning, we know as we meet in the neutral state, which is uh, Switzerland, a democracy, uh, that it was uh, not always obvious that to be able to guarantee this uh, reciprocity, this reliability, this efficiency, and this respect uh, for correspondence and the private uh, sphere. So what I'm really trying to say is that the history of the Universal Postal Union which uh, we have been looking into over the last couple of years. And I think uh, that there are many more years of research that are necessary to examine all of this, is that uh, this matter is political. And it uh, should remain the subject of academic research. And it is uh, uh, very different uh, from uh, other issues uh, that we face, uh, be they diplomatic, economic, or social. Thank you for your attention. I wanted to start with dear children, but I realized they left. Distinguished speakers and participants, uh, it is an honor for me and a privilege, actually, uh, personally, also to host you here in UPU. As we wrap up our rich discussion, I would like to thank you all, the speakers and contributors, for their engagement and enthusiasm in putting a spotlight on the UPU, Universal Postal Union, in the academic world for the first time since the organization's foundation. 
Our speakers, a mix of historians, academics, and philatelists, have told us why and how the UPU, which was founded by 22 nations, grew to connect 192 member countries. Thank you all for dedicated efforts to study our organization's literature, share insights, foster exchange, and contribute to building knowledge about our past in order to nurture our present and shape our future. We have also seen how the postal industry has not only adapted to change, but has also played a significant role in shaping the landscape over the course of a century and a half. In closing, I hope that acquiring academic understanding of the postal industry's history will guide us with a refreshed global promise to enable communication and empower peoples across nations. Allow me to express my sincere appreciation to our partners, France La Poste, Group and Historical Committee for the Post, as well as the Sirise Laboratory for bringing laboratory for bringing together this truly exceptional event. I'm also pleased to announce that the proceeding of this conference will be published in the form of a paper book, paper book, which I'm convinced will be a landmark publication. My final words of thanks go to our UPU team for all their efforts in organizing this memorable occasion. You all know postal services have always contributed to better communication. And this is essential. Only communication can bring peace, what we need today, very much. I thank you all. I wish you all a safe travels on your journeys. Thank you very much.